was, let's see, re recording. Um, he said, if I think about something I need to do and I don't do it right then, I will forget about it. And I, that is a hundred percent true. So the minute I think about something, I think about good old dad's advice and, uh, I try and I'm not very good at it all the time, but, <laughs> um, so while I'm on the kick, I'll go ahead and kind of start kicking it off a little bit here. And then as people keep joining, but what I was about to say is where we are in the market, you know, it's been so easy to invest for the last 10 years since the crash, really, everything was always going up. Interest rates were low. Prices have gone up a lot, but they were low at some point. Like it was just easy to be an investor. And what happened during that time is consumers, if you think about the difference between a consumer and an investor, consumers were real. It was easy for everybody to invest. You didn't have to have an investor's mindset to invest in the last 10 years because it was so easy. And yeah, things can still go wrong, all that. But for the most part, with everything going up, interest rates cheap, prices cheap, it's just easy, right? So what a lot of us saw, and Aaron can probably attest to this, probably Al, everyone who's been around for the last 10 years, people who don't actually have investor mindsets were investing, which is phenomenal. Don't get me wrong, because I, I want everybody investing. But it also, like, now times have changed. Cash flow is king is no longer the motto. And now in order to invest and to feel good about investing, in my opinion, you really have to adopt an investor's mindset. Now we can't be consumers pretending to be investors. We have to be actual investors. So what does that mean? Now that cash flow is no longer king because of the interest rates, because of the prices, just because of where all the markets are, you know, we're so far past the crash. During the crash, it was easy for cash flow. We're not in that environment anymore. And so a lot of people are like, well, it doesn't hit the 1% rule. I'm out of here. Or they're like, well, I'm not getting $300 cash flow a month. I'm out of here. So those consumers now, I'm tangled up in my microphone cord here. Um, I don't know. What's, how, I don't know how I got so tangled. Um, a lot of those consumers have dropped off. Because they, they're like, well, the cash flow isn't there. Well, the 1% rule is not there. I'm not going to know how would I ever make money on this. And the investor mindset is really, you have to understand how rental properties really make money. And I won't go onto the soapbox, but they make money in five different ways. Cash flow, appreciation, tax benefits, uh, equity build via mortgage pay down, and hedging against inflation. If you picture it like a bar graph, it used to be where the cash flow bar was high. And so everything else was kind of secondary. The cash flow bar is not high now. So how do we focus on the other profit centers? Because right now, my personal opinion is that we're in a completely normal investing environment. And that's what people don't understand because they're used to the last 10 years where it was this like, call it a bonus investing environment. It was so much easier, so much more profitable, all these things. But does that mean we're in a bad environment for investing now? And I think hardcore, the answer is no. We're actually in completely normal times. And so where I kind of got going on this little spiel unexpectedly was thinking of, you know, Aaron speaking from the lending side and talking about your lenders helping with strategy, because now strategy matters. How am I going to take advantage of investing in this market in the conditions it's in, not that it's bad conditions, it's normal conditions, we're just not used to it. So that's where kind of coming full circle on my little spiel there is why it's so important about the lender because they have that insight and they can help you. Aaron's gonna kind of go through some different options. Like if you buy a property right now and you don't like your interest rate, are you stuck with it forever? Absolutely not. And Aaron's gonna tell you, uh, I always mix up the words, uh, marry the property date the right right yeah it, yes exactly <laughs> exactly so the lender that you work with this is kind of my pitch for working with somebody like aaron graham aaron chapman all those guys is that it can make a difference that was a very long story to tell you that it can make a difference on what lender you work with and a lot of people come to me and they're like well i want to shop around lenders and find the cheapest rate and i'm like yeah, okay do that but the rates they can vary a little bit, but at the end of the day, it's kind of like, it's like insurance companies. I don't want the cheapest insurance company because I want a company who's actually going to pay me out if something happens. So when it comes to the lenders, I don't agree about finding just the cheapest one you can find. It's who's going to work with you and be a partner with you. And when you develop the relationships with Aaron, Graham, all those folks, 
it becomes a long-term relationship and, you know, I'm, I'll let Aaron kind of take over, but you know, it's, so that's my pitch for what lenders you work with. Yeah. And, and I like the, I like kind of the big picture, um, how you started with kind of the big picture there, Allie, and kind of worked in as far as what we've seen in the investor environment the past five, 10 years. And yeah, you, you put it in a, a great way in the fact that investors have been a little bit spoiled over, you know, the past decade or so, uh, you know, as far as where, where rates have been, of course, uh, you know, during the COVID years, when our primary residence rates were bottom bottoming out at, at 2%, our investor rates were, were, you know, two and a half, 3%, uh, for, you know, a month or two there, uh, that was incredible. And yes, tons of, uh, new buyers were, were flooding the field. Cause yeah, a couple of years ago, you could get that, yeah, yeah, just under three percent rate. Twenty percent down. Like, wah, wah, killer wah, wah, cash flow. I know, I know. And, <laughs> and but the reality is, we're we're not there anymore, and and we're not going to be there. Uh, you know, really. Uh, you know, as far as those COVID rates, I would never count on that again. Uh, but I, I do want to back up a little bit and kind of uh give a a layout of what we've been seeing in the mortgage world as far as rates concerned, where we've kind of been at the past year. And of course, you know, the, the crystal ball, uh, you know, answer that everyone wants, when are these things going to turn around? When can we get back to maybe a, a 6% or something like that uh, for an investment property? So it's not to, to dive into too many numbers and, and stats and, and bore everyone to death, but one of the the biggest key indicators that that kind of has always gone hand in hand with rates, you go back 5, 10, 20, 30 years, uh, it's it's really always going to be inflation. Yes, there are other components that that do impact uh, mortgage rates, unemployment, uh, housing, you know, things like that. Uh, but one of the big indicators we like to keep an eye on in the mortgage world is inflation. So what happened whenever the Fed funds rate, when we kind of bottomed out, uh, you know, two, three years ago is, uh, of course, inflation shot up. We got all the way up to 9.1% in June of 2022. So a year and a couple months ago, that was our, our peak uh, uh, level. For reference, we always historically have liked to trend it around two, two and a half percent for kind of that target inflation level. So as rates, as everything got really, really cheap uh, to help out, which was great, uh, all those numbers got out of whack, shot up to 9% June. That's whenever we saw the string of we're up to, you know, 11, 12 now over, you know, 13, 14 meetings, all these Fed hikes start to, to uh, take course. Now, when the Fed hikes the Fed funds rate, which is what you always see in the news, uh, you know, there was some news that happened this past week. We'll talk about that in a second. But when they hike that, that's not a direct, uh, you know, they hike that a quarter point. So now all of a sudden mortgage raters, mortgage rates are up a quarter point. It's it's technically the overnight borrowing for all the big the borrowing rate for all the big banks out there. So whenever they do raise that, it's a small lagging effect, but it impacts, yes, your mortgage rates, credit cards, car loans, all that. So they've been working strategically with all these hikes to get that back down. Where are we at as of uh this past week? We're down to 3.7%. We we're at 3.2 before that, doing a little bit better. We kind of spiked up this month, but all those hikes are essentially working. So we're trending in the right direction, which is awesome, which is great, but we're still at 3.7% for just one of the indicators, uh, of course, the Fed watches, but we've still got some substantial work to do in the eyes of the Fed. They've kind of backed off this, uh, just being so adamant about getting down to the 2%. They've kind of backed out backed off that the past two meetings they're they're kind of coming to, to terms that okay maybe two and a half somewhere in that realm would be a little bit uh better but we're making progress on that it just takes time for it to you know ultimately impact the economy impact these rates there is a trickle down effect uh but it takes some time so as far as rates are concerned uh you know this level that we've been at we've really kind of been at a plateaued level if you will for past two, three, four months before that, we were just kind of on this slight, 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 slight incline. And it seems like over the past couple of months, we've kind of plateaued out. Uh, the market's still very volatile, but but we've plateaued out. 
uh, we had a, a Fed meeting just this past week. They did choose to to pause on rate hikes. That wasn't news to anyone. That's what we kind of expected in the industry. Uh, a pause this time around. We've got two more meetings before the end of the year, and we're expecting one more rate hike before the end of the year. So when we see that come out, November or December, uh, just don't be alarmed. That that's what we're already kind of uh, anticipating in the industry and on our side as far as the loan officers the the uh, you know people watching these things daily we're really expecting that to be our last as far as hiking the fed funds rate that to be the last hike now when are we actually going to start to see you know stopping the hike is one thing when are we going to actually start to see some some turnaround uh, of rates uh, of course, no one really has the answer to that question. The latest uh, consensus is probably second or third quarter 2024 uh, is when we're going to start to see, okay, maybe, you know, the, a slart. And, and I would anticipate a really slow decline, kind of like for the bulk of this year, we've been on, you know, kind of a really slow uh, incline plateaued now, but when they do start to turn around in, you know, second, third quarter next year, it's going to take some time. It's not going to be like COVID where we were sitting for investor rates, five and a half or so percent. And then a month and a half goes by and we're at, you know, three and a half percent. It's just not going to happen. So it, it kind of leads me to transition to my next point as far as uh, a lot of buyers just being nervous to, to you know, the, the weighted out approach. Well, you know, rates suck right now, uh, you know, uh, maybe I'll just wait around for a year or two. Then I can really maybe find a property I really like. Maybe I'll get closer to that one percent rule. All valid points. Uh, but I what what I like to argue there is, uh, you know, when these rates do start to turn around in your mind, whenever we're, you know, for for everyone's reference, we're at, you know, let's call it seven and a half percent. That's where we've been at for investment property loans. To give you a frame of reference, seven to seven and a half percent. We've been there for, you know, really the bulk of this year. So when these things start to turn around, I don't anticipate, you know, March where it's seven and a half and then come August where it's six and a half. I think it's going to take a lot more time than that. So this approach of, of waiting and kind of holding out, well, you're going to be holding out maybe a lot longer than you think. And all of a sudden that's a year gone by that you could have had another property under your belt two years, three years, playing on all those other points that Ali mentioned as far as appreciation, things like that, uh, you know, getting more equity in the home. Another point to argue that, that I like to, uh, you know, motivate, encourage my buyers not to, you know, sit out all of 2023 is when these rates do start to turn around, and yes, it's not going to be major, but when they when they do start to turn around, it's going to be, uh, you know, flooding the media everywhere, just like all this year, we've just seen, you know, every month kind of that week or two where it's just nailing, you know, rates and, and real estate and all of that. And when these rates do start to turn around, all these buyers are going to come out of the woodworks again. We've been kind of in a I like to call it kind of a quiet buyer's market this past year. Buyers have quietly gotten more power. You're not fighting against as many offers. Even there's, you know, a rise of seller credits coming back to help some, you know, with help with some of those increased prices. So long story short, I guess, is, you know, when these things start to turn around next summer, the competition is going to go up tenfold. There's going to be lots more people trying to buy. And uh, at that point, you look at your cash flow on your maybe 100K loan, and it's like, okay, I just waited a year to pay five grand more for this house that I'm going to save $15 a month on because I've got seven and a quarter now compared to seven and a half uh, for the interest rate. So there's some things. And hey, like Aaron, that. I want to I want to clarify what you're saying to make yeah. to pull this really big picture, which is what Aaron is saying is that if you a lot of people have the mindset right now, well, let me wait till the interest rates drop. Well, what they don't realize is going to happen. Number one, like Aaron said, that's going to be a that's over a good amount of time, so it could be a decent amount of wait. And when that happens, two things are very likely potentials. Number one, the prices of the houses are going to go up. So most people who are holding out because of the high interest rates is for a cash flow issue, right? Like you want a certain amount of cash flow every month, you're not getting it because the interest rates are high. Well, if you wait until the interest rate drops 
you know, somewhere between what a quarter and 1% or whatever, one and a half, even 2% for that matter. If the price of the house goes up over that time, that difference in cash flow that you were waiting on is irrelevant because you've just traded the interest rate for the purchase price. So that's point number one. And then point number two is that when he's talking about the buyer's market, when it starts shifting and all the competition comes out of the work work right now, I'll cover your ears, but the buyers have the leverage. Like you guys, no pun intended for you know loans. Get it? Get it? Ha. <laughs> love it. Love um, it. But you know the buyers have the leverage because the sellers don't have the upper hand right now because it is a buyer's market. So not only are you going to start losing leverage progressively as more people come out of the woodwork, you're also contending with higher purchase prices. Which is Aaron, correct me if I'm wrong. Historically, what happens when the rates go? down, the prices are going to go up. So that cash flow yes. holdout isn't really helpful. And then I'm kind of uh, like spoiler alert and I'll let Aaron take over on this. It's like, well, what's a possible solution for this? Because on one hand, you have the high interest rate now, but you have the leverage and the lower price. Later, you have the lower interest rate, but the higher price and without the leverage. But what if none of those things happen? Yada, yada, yada. Well, Aaron can speak to this, but at least the Parham team, and I know some other lenders are also, are offering free refinances within three years of the purchase. So in my mind, the solution to all of this and with the unknowns is if you buy the property now, while well, you have the leverage, while the prices are low, and Aaron can speak a little bit. I know there's things in the news about prices are going to go down soon, and that's not necessarily applicable across the board. So Aaron can kind of speak to that. But uh, I just lost my train of thought after all that. Is if you get the property now at the lower price with your leverage and you still have the higher interest rate, if the rate goes down at some point, you'll get to refinance for free. So you've kept all the good stuff of getting the property now, and then you get to refi into that lower rate. If that rate never goes down because people are wondering, well, you know, what happened? Well, guess what? You just got the best rate you could if it never goes down. So that's one, you know, one thing I'm trying, it goes back to this investor mindset of it's not about timing the market. That has very rarely worked for anybody because no matter what people predict, who knows what's gonna happen. It's learning how to maneuver with what you have. So I love everything Aaron presented and I'll let him keep going on too. Is, yeah, no, you know, those are the different components you're looking at. It's like, okay, here's my puzzle pieces. How am I going to make this work for me? And that's where the investor mindset comes in, where the consumer mindset that I talked about earlier is they, that's, that doesn't happen there. And just real quick before I give it back to Aaron, welcome to everyone who has jumped on since if you came in in the middle of that. Um, I'm Allie. If you don't know who I am, I assume you do if you're on this call. Um, we've got I don't see my windows just shifted. Aaron Stelly is part of the Parham team. So if you've heard of Graham Parham as one of, he's been around turnkey world for ever. Uh, yeah. Graham is in Mexico, way too cool for us this weekend. So, but Aaron works right alongside with him. We've got Al, who is my absolute favorite turnkey provider, probably of all of them, if, especially for Detroit, but maybe of all of them. Um, so just kind of a, a couple of you heard me say this already. We're just having an open, casual conversation, bring some life back into what's going on in the real estate market. Aaron is talking about things from the lending side. We're going to bring in Al later to talk about from the property side. And if at any point uh, you guys have questions, you can either throw it in the chat or raise your hand like Tarina did. So we'll let her ask your question in just a second. Um, this is open uh casual nothing formal so everyone gets to know each other wanted to bring together some like-minded folks everyone who's watching this on the replay welcome also so i will in a second hand it back to aaron but i'll check in trina if you have a question let's check in with you yes um thank you so much um wealth of information thus far thank you and the question ali the five ways that you said um uh, we can make money in, in rental properties. You went through it pretty quickly and I, I really wanted to capture it. So I've, uh, the first two I remember hearing is the cat positive cash flow, the tax benefits, and what were the other three? I will tell you those right now. And I'll also put a link to a video that I recorded that explains them. I'll put it in the chat so you can, because uh, the video will go a little bit more into detail about it. Let's put that. Five profit. 
centers. Okay, so you guys all have that video. So the short of the profit centers is that, uh, and Al and Aaron jump in with me if you guys have any additions to this, but or maybe not additional profit centers, but more to say about it. But rental properties, my favorite thing about them, they actually make money in five different ways. It's not just one way. Like a lot of people just focus on cash flow. People kind of know about appreciation, but part of this investor mindset that we're talking about is really understanding those five profit centers because when you understand those, it gives you more knowledge and more leverage to be able to maneuver. It's like, how am I going to make this property work for me? And if I know all the ways it can work for me, I can, you know, fiddle around and put those puzzle pieces together. And also understanding the profit centers in my mind helps a lot with risk mitigation because you wanna know not only how to get those profits from different income streams, but you wanna understand what risks are applicable to those. Like what's a risk, you know, appreciation, for example. If you buy a shack in an awful area with, you know, no gentrification ever come in, just a bad area, you're not going to, that's a risk to that appreciate, it's a risk to a lot actually, but you know, the appreciation bar, you're going to be lowering that potential, but the five profit centers, so cash flow, which most people are familiar with at this point, because of the last 10 years, cash flow was king. That was the big thing. And it was true during the crash, especially my very first turnkey, not to make you guys jealous, but my very first turnkey really nice. It's in a easily B plus neighborhood, two story, fully rehab tenants in place at the time. It was $55,000 and it was renting for nine seventy five. dollars Now it's renting for $1,800, which is ridiculous. And I'm like, don't even get me started on the profit centers of that thing. But back in the crash days, that's why cash flow became so known because cash flow on a nine seventy five dollars rent on a $55,000 property is ridiculous. And it was in Georgia. So taxes and insurance are super low. So we all know the cash flow uh, profit center. The next one most people are familiar with is appreciation. Of course, everything's going to go up in value at some point over time. The question is how much and well, is it depending on what you buy? Again, that's why you want to be careful. And the different risk factors play into appreciation. And a lot of times people like I personally would rather take lower cash flow on a nicer property because of that appreciation bar. Like a nicer property in a primarily owner occupied neighborhood, great neighborhood, all of that. I'd rather pay more with lower cash flow because ultimately the hard part about appreciation is it is speculation. And I do respect that. But at the same time, appreciation gives you a lot more profit than cash flow does. There's no real estate super successful mogul out there who's only rich on real estate from the cash flow. Like that's not, it's it's all five profit centers together. And that appreciation one is huge. And we all know how appreciation works. The third one is the tax benefits. I'm awful at explaining. I, I'm not a CPA. I don't actually, if my dad had a, my, so everyone who doesn't know my dad's on here, uh, but if he had a camera working, he could tell you everything about the taxes. Um, but the tax benefits on rental properties, residential real estate is one of the most advantageously uh, structured asset classes as far as the IRS goes. So the tax benefits are biggest on residential real estate investment properties. So that I remember I had a corporate job at the time when I started buying properties. So I had a W-2 paycheck. All of a sudden, when I started buying properties, my tax returns were getting higher and higher. And I thought, what is going on? And I, I had not uh, taken into account how good the tax benefits are. And I won't go into details. There's depreciation is the big one, the phantom uh, write-off. Uh, but the tax benefits are huge. So it's a profit center. And if you actually do the math on how much you can earn, like get cash in your pocket because of the tax benefits, it's kind of a surprising amount. Uh, equity build via mortgage pay down the whole if you have a loan on the property the whole time your tenants are paying down your mortgage for you. The more your mortgage gets paid down and this is Aaron's territory, the more your mortgage gets paid down, the more equity you have in the property. So that equity is building on your property via somebody else paying the mortgage for you. And then the last one is Aaron was kind of talking about this before hedging against inflation. This, I I can never get, it's in my brain. It doesn't come out of my mouth very gracefully, but the value of the dollar decreases over time. So if you buy a property in 2023 dollars, let's call it $100,000, 
at some period in the future, that same $100,000 may only be worth the equivalent of what we know as $70,000 right now. But when you get it, this is also Aaron's territory. When you get a fixed rate loan, you're, you're paying back your property and your loan in today's dollars, not the inflated dollars. So you're actually gaining on the inflation side. Aaron can probably explain that a heck of a lot better than I can. So all five of those together, cash flow, appreciation, tax benefits, equity build via mortgage pay down, and hedging against inflation. I always, I picture everything in a bar graph, but I picture all those in a bar graph. And when you put those things together, that's where all the, the billionaires and the millionaires and the real estate moguls, that's where they've gotten profitable, not just from the cash flow bar. So that's a lot of this investor mindset too, is don't just look at the cash flow bar because even when cash flow is good, it it it's not it doesn't carry the whole investment by itself anyways. So I want to get I want to help get people off this cash flow obsession. Yes, cash flow is important. We'll we'll especially talk to Al about cash flow because Detroit right now in my mind has the best cash flow I know of any of the markets. So cash flow is still you know I don't want to completely take all of its merit away. It's still good. But people's reliance on it is really is stopping a lot of them from investing when it shouldn't. So uh, that's actually a little more than I wanted to say about the five profit centers. But definitely check out the video, too, and um, kind of drive. And if at any point you guys have questions, if you watch the video, come back. You know, I'll also put my e Well, you guys probably have my email. We'll put my email address in here. You can if you go to sleep tonight, you wake up and you're like, oh, what was that? thing or you know whatever questions you can always pop them in and Aaron I'll give it back to you for a second if you want to say anything to kind of drive home the your yeah you're no, the lending the, guy. no that was great what my takeaway on that was you know the 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 rate which everyone gets focuses on you know focuses on the cash flow that's you know one of five of you know 20 percent we're talking there's a lot of other ways to generate you know wealth on that property or you know as you build um your portfolio but going back to your previous point too uh, Ali about, you know, us recognizing the state of the environment as a lender. Uh, yeah, it's absolutely right. So we, you know, all the loans, all our loans right now, uh, refinances, purchases, investment, you know, across the board, uh, you know, after we close within three years, if, if rates have gone down and you want to come back and refinance with us, we'll absolutely uh, waive our lender fee. We can't control, you know, important to note, uh, as you do your planning, we can't control, you know, title costs and things like that. But as far as what we charge as the lender, uh, it's $1,394 uh, flat rate, just under $1,400. That will be waived on the refinance down the road. So just going back to the whole, you know, adage of, of you know, marry the property, date the rate, uh, just because you're at, you know, seven and a half today, uh, it doesn't mean you're going to be at there for the life of the loan. Uh, you know, our Fannie Mae loans don't have a prepayment penalty. So we back you on that refi. And then uh, also going back to Ali's point, as far as, you know, how we're here as a team to help you strategize when we do start to see some downturn in rates down the road, uh, you know, you won't have to play that guessing game as the borrower. All you have to do is reach out to, you know, me and Graham say, Hey, it, would it make sense for me to take advantage of the free, you know, refi program now? What are your thoughts? We run through that actual math with you, find out that break even on what those closing costs would be for the refi. So, you know, okay, I pull out this refi, I'm down at, you know, six and a half percent. And, uh, you know, I make up the closing costs associated with that, you know, within the year from the refi, so to speak. So, uh, you know, we're there to, to help gauge that another kind of, uh, couple of random tidbits with the market that I just think is important to, to educate everyone out there, uh, you know, who's buying right now. And especially if you're going to be using financing, we get the question, uh, you know, almost daily, you know, everyone wants to know what's the deal with points, right? Like what, what are points? Why are they tied to, to loans all of a sudden? Uh, you know, what's going on there? I got, you know, a, a loan a couple of years ago, I got, you know, 5% no points. I got a house before that and it was, you know, 6% no points. And now, you know, a loan officer quotes me and they're saying seven and a half, two points or, you know, 7% two and a half points, what does that mean? And points are a very real uh, real thing to know about in the mortgage world environment right now. And what a point is, is it's associated with your interest rate for the loan. In a wonderful, perfect rate environment, we have what is called zero point pricing, meaning we can offer you as the borrower 
a rate, that current market rate for the day, say it's 7%. And we can give it to you with zero points, meaning there's no extra cost associated to obtain that rate. Well, what's happened, it's been this way for really all of 2023, is that zero point pricing is really no longer available. And this has even impacted primary residence uh, loans as well, which historically speaking are always going to be about a percent better than your non-owner occupied rates. So to put it kind of in layman's terms uh, today, the least amount of points, for example, that we could even offer on a loan, and, and I'm certainly not trying to discourage anyone, but it's things to be aware of as a buyer. The highest rate, least amount of points today I might be able to offer you might be 7.5% at two points. And you as the borrower might say, okay, well, I want to do away with points. You know, I don't care about rate. What if we just raise the rate, go to 8%, 8 8.25%, can I get zero points then? Unfortunately, the investors buying these loans, Wall Street buying these loans, Fannie Mae, they're not offering that zero point pricing. They understand just like we do on our end, helping with the, the free refi, things like that. They fully understand that these 30 year notes ain't lasting 30 year notes at you know, 30 years at seven and a half percent. So those margins have shrunk. And the impact there is you as the borrower are having to bridge that gap in order to get that loan. So the zero point pricing a lot of times is not going to be there. You'll be at, you know, say seven and a half percent at one or two points to start. And then yes, if you want to buy the rate down further, which is something we would walk through with, you know, okay, maybe seven and a quarter at a, you know, two points, seven percent at two and a half and and so forth. But the other thing going back to uh which I keep saying that, Ali, you brought up so much good stuff already, but going back how, you know, Ali talks about tax benefits. Well, good thing to know about points, they're tax deductible. So that's a, a easy write-off. Of course, I'm not a CPA, I'm not an advisor, but uh, it's it's commonly known, you know, points along with that mortgage interest, uh, that'll, that'll be tax deductible at the end of the year. Another thing we're saying, I'll cover your ears. Some of these sellers are, are helping cover some of these points in the form of seller credits. So if, uh, you know, you're at seven and a half percent with two points, which two points, uh, it, that's based off the loan amount. That's 2% of the loan amount. If you get a 2% seller credit, maybe off the purchase price, well, now they're covering your points and then some. Uh, so and together, me and you, Aaron, um, we just did it for the gentleman that's closing next week. And yeah, we, on Monday, I believe. Yep. Yeah. Or Tuesday. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. His, his uh, purchase price a little bit, and we gave him a 2.5% concession to help with his closing costs. So yeah, and and things like that, guys. A year from now, Al is probably not going to be offering that because <laughs> because again, we're probably going to be in a little bit uh, you know different rate environment, and that goes back to you know buyers. While okay, rates might not be ideal right now, got a lot more power, a lot more tools than than one might not realize. Well, and one thing that I'll uh, call out too that Graham actually presented to me, I think it was last. Fall is that that that's when the interest rates jumped the big time. Yeah, that was when yep, everyone's like, right. oh. "We've been on, we've been a year now about on that." Yep. Mm-hmm. Oh, oh yay anniversary. <laughs> um. So when that happened, what was pretty standard in Turnkey World, and I had not met Al yet, so I don't know what he was doing, but it was very standard that the seller, the Turnkey provider, was bringing was paying two points, and the buyer was paying two points. So a grand total of four points because sellers can only pay two points, right, Aaron? They, two they two can't percent of the sales 2%. price is what yeah, so be limited to. That became a strategy for people: is that the sellers are paying two, the buyers are paying two, and then Graham said, "Well, hang on a second. That's one option." The, and so what I'm about to tell you, this goes into this whole idea of strategizing the investor mindset. So that's one strategy is to buy down your rate as much as you can right now. Graham's take on it was, and he's like, look, I'll do whatever you want to do. But here's my thought on it is that save your money. Well, still take Al's money for the two credits there, but for your buy, for your buyer points, he's Graham suggested save your money. Don't pay the money to buy down your rate. 
get the higher rate. And then when rates drop and they do the free refinance, use that same money to then buy that rate down. So you're actually buying down the lower rate, not the higher rate. Because if you buy down, you spend your, you don't get a refund on that. Like, oh, I would like my points back now. You're going to put money towards that rate. You're going to buy down your higher rate. But then if the rate drops within that three years, you're going to refinance out of that rate anyways, and you don't get that money back for the points. So Graham's stance on it was save your money, except for take owls, save your money, and then use that money to, so let's say it's at seven and a half now, at some point it's at five and a half, just for easy numbers, buy down the five and a half lower, not the seven and a half. So you've kind of, so then when that whole thing started, like I saw, I think sellers are, pretty generous about the two because they can adjust the purchase price also right to help figure that's that correct. out but that's correct as people kind of started taking on Graham's stance about that also not because just because Graham said it but it's a good strategy is the sellers it's not an immediate assumption of oh they'll pay two I'll pay two now it's kind of like a what do you want to do this goes back into that strategizing as an investor which route do I want to go and some people still feel more comfortable buying down the rate now because they're like well what if it never drops Totally fine. But again, pointing out that there are so many options and where it is marry the price and date, marry the price, date the rate. Why is that not? Property. Yeah, it does not stay in my head. <laughs> uh, and it's the most fun one too. And it doesn't stay there. But it's the, that is the date, the rate, because it's not a permanent end all. If you get a seven and a half percent interest right now, that's not the end of it. And going a little bit off top, well, not off topic, but kind of circling back to those five profit centers. One thing I wanted to say before, and to kind of drive home a lot of what we're talking about now, I, let's see, 2000, or 2021, I hit the 10 year mark on my first properties. And then, you know, so I have all my properties now for 10 plus years. And what I can tell you, first of all, I have I think I have a couple of the original interest rates. I've refinanced. That has changed my cash flow. My when I hit the 10-year mark, I looked back over the 10 years of these properties and I'm like, okay, what what's happened over 10 years? I'll tell you what, those five profit centers, they don't act individually. They do kind of in the beginning a little bit, but over time they start compounding with each other. And it's not like a linear increase. It's a compounding exponential increase. And part of over those 10 years, part of that has been adjusting my uh, rates. I've refinanced a couple properties into lower rates that increased my cash flow. The biggest thing I underestimated in 10 years was the rent increases. My, I told you my first turnkey was renting for 975 when I bought it and it's rented at 1800 right now. And my purchase price didn't change on that. And my rate didn't change on that. My mortgage payment didn't change on that. Tax and insurance went up, but not nearly as much as the rent increase. So to kind of uh, not directly speak to what Aaron's talking about, but to really stick with kind of our theme here is that these are compounding profits. And the, the rate conversation, that's why it's not as important what the rate is right now, because Rental properties are long-term investments. If you want to go flip a property and get your biggest profit in a year or two or whatever, go do it. Have fun paying the taxes on it, but go do it. Rental properties are long-term investments. I've had some rental properties that have had massive turnover costs or massive unexpected costs. I've had bad property managers. But over that 10-year look back, they're almost irrelevant. And part of that, as I'm holding all of these properties, part of that is working with the lenders to, you know, when the rates drop to what, two, three, and 4% during 2020, I looked at some of my properties because I certainly didn't have an interest rate that low. But even, I think one of the properties, for example, was like a 5% or 4.75 or something. And I could have gotten it down to like three, three and a half. But when I actually did the math on it, it was kind of not, it wasn't really worth it. So I just held on at the higher interest rate. That interest rate, despite what people think, is not the end all of the investment. So that's why, you know, I kind of bring that up to tie in the five profit centers, but tie in what Aaron's saying is that the interest rates are one of many players in the investment game. And so that's why I don't want people to get scared away from them. And like we're talking about with Aaron, there's so many things you can do to adjust and accommodate and pivot. Maybe your cash flow is not perfect today, but it can be later. Yes, there's speculation. We know that, but like that's that's the investor mindset. 
with that, um, does anybody have, we just threw a whole bunch of lending stuff and mindset stuff and everything at you. Does anyone have any questions? If you want to put it in the chat or raise your hand, uh, if you just want to make a comment, if you have any of your own experiences related to what we're talking about, um, Frank, where ever my boxes move, Frank, I, I know you had at least one question. Yeah, thank you, Allie. Uh, and thanks for, for you all being here today with us. We appreciate your time. A um, couple of quick ones. I know my first question was what the minimum loan amount is with. Sorry, Frank, your... I completely. Yeah, so we're 50K uh, on our end. So it sounds like those ones uh, where the purchase price might be 50 or so might be a little bit too low. Um, but yeah, our minimum loan amount is 50K. One thing on that point, uh, so the, the minimum down payment percentage is 20% down. I've noticed this. This is new as of the past couple weeks. Uh, the 20% pricing has really uh, gone away the past couple of weeks on us, Fannie Mae-wise. It's, it's been in a state where it's requiring like five or so points, which fails a, a, a fee threshold test. So on those really, you know, I'd say from to be cautious, even, you know, 50 to maybe 80 K loan amounts. Uh, you know, if, if you're, if you're buying hundred K price, I would, or hundred K property, I would be cautious with planning to put 20% down. Uh, you know, I would recommend reaching out. So ideally, you know, Frank, the lowest we could go, if you look at like a, a, a 66,666 property with 25 down, that puts a loan amount right at 50 K. And that's about, uh, you know, as low as far as purchase price, I would recommend, uh, you know, running through us. And just to clarify for anybody watching who is not as familiar, like in case you aren't totally clear on what numbers Aaron's saying is if their minimum loan amount is $50,000, that is when you get a loan, you have, there's the purchase price. We'll call it a hundred thousand dollars. There's the purchase price. Let's say you put 25,000 down. So your loan amount is 75,000. So that 50,000 number that he's giving is your purchase price is not $50,000. Your loan is $50,000. So if you were doing 20%, the property would have to be what? 62,500, 62, 5. 5, yep. 5, And then 25% down, it'd have to be 66 as the minimal purchase price, just to clarify what the 50,000 yeah. threshold is. There are lenders out there. I can't think of them off the top of my head who can do lower. Um, but yeah, that just kind of depends on the lender. Yeah, they're, they're out there and they do come and go. So, you know, not worth completely dismissing a, a property if it's, you know, down there, you, you know, do a little bit of looking around and, you know, they are out there from time to time. But yeah, 50K uh, is our, our minimum. Frank, did you have, you said you had one more question, right? Uh, yeah, I, I was just going to go back to what he was just, what you were just saying. So what price point would you have to be at or say purchase price to get the best scenario with, like you mentioned, with points and. Ooh, and I like it. Yeah, lo loaded question, right? Ooh. Yeah, no, and it's a great <laughs> like, question. That's that's a great question. So, and this is where we pause the video and start charging everybody for being here. Yeah, can we can we turn <laughs> off the cord? <laughs> No, but it, it, no, that's a great question, Frank. And it used to be kind of a little bit more clear cut. What have what we have seen just as a general trend in pricing is the higher our loan amounts have gotten, the worse pricing has gotten. So the 50 to 80K, 90K loan amount we were just talking, uh, once you really start to get down, you know, during that 50, 60 K, it starts to slip away, but really, you know, take an 80 K loan amount and the pricing is really just going to lately is just going to get worse, the higher. So a hundred K loan with 25% down, we might be at seven and a half percent with two points today, take a 300 K loan. And now that's going to be seven and a half percent closer to three points, uh, for comparison. So, the higher loan amounts and and really you know depending on the market unless you're like going out to the florida market that's really the only like where the bulk of those higher you know higher price turnkey investment a lot of them are new builds of course but and you know your markets like you know really all your major turnkey go to markets detroit uh, you know, Memphis, St. Louis, things like that, you're going to be right around that 100K loan amount as an average, uh, more or less. And uh, and that's been just fine. But to answer your question, though, Frank, 
it, it, there's not ex, you know exact breaks because we're pulling from a lot of investors, but as the loan amount does go up, that pricing does drop off. And that's okay. that's new as of the past six to eight months. Uh, for the longest time, for, for several years there, we could have a 55K loan, match that up to a 355K loan, and that pricing would be just about identical. So that's just one of the those, uh, as the volatility has come this year, uh, that we've seen that stretch kind of exaggerate, if you will. Okay, that's that's opposite what I would have thought. So it's pretty eye-opening. <laughs> Yeah. And, and then as the, uh, you know, historically speaking, if you're taking 20 versus 25, the, the 25, of course, is, is always going to be uh, much better. That 20% in, in a lot of situations uh, has been coming and going the past month or so. Um, so what I recommend, you know, once we do have a borrower pre-approved, they got a contract that's ready, or even if you're scoping out a pro forma, uh, you know, you can always pop us off an email and we'll get back to you, you know, within the hour with, you know, hey, here's where we're sitting today or, you know vice versa so okay okay that's great thank you um my second question was um again i guess it's kind of the same uh type of question but we ended up purchasing a couple of properties in cash one was uh 70,000 one was 60,000 and in the future if we wanted to do cash out refis Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's something that we can certainly help with. Uh, the the keys to know there uh, is the loan amount max is going to be 75% of the appraised value. Another big thing, you said you bought these properties all cash. Mm -hmm. So if we're, if we're talking, if you're trying to do the cash out refinance within the first six months, we can absolutely do that. It, it fits another box. It's called delayed financing. And that's kind of a, a whole nother beast, but really super easy. Kind of the only thing there is we can't give you back more than you paid for the property within those first six months. Once we get outside those six months, we will give you back, you know, 70 if it appraises at 200K, you bought it for 60K. We're at month seven and it appraises for 200K. We're giving you back 75% of that, not looking any further. The appraisal is our due diligence to, you know, justify the property's value. Uh, another thing important to mention on the cash out scenario, this is new as of, I need to get the, the exact month, but this is new as of this year. I want to say it came out February, March in the Fannie Mae guidelines. And this would apply if you purchase those properties with the first lien mortgage, uh, Frank. So this wouldn't apply in your case where they were all cash, but if you do have a property that, that you get with a first lien mortgage, your standard mortgage, and you want to do a cash out refinance on that, and this goes for all types of homes, primary, second investment, the new rule is you've got to wait a year before Fannie Mae will let you do a cash out refinance on that. So that that one is new. Uh, it's only been out there for about six, seven months now. A lot of people aren't uh, you know, aware about that, but someone might be planning, okay, I'll, you know, buy this property now, 25% down, 75% mortgage, and then maybe eight months down the road, I'll do a cash out. I feel great about it. Well, we got to wait a full 12 months before you can do that. So that's a, a new kind of gotcha out there in the world of cash outs. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, so we just had one question pop up. Uh, about the refinance terms. You mentioned a free refi. Does the time frame to use that free refi have time limits? Do we have to refi within three years, five years? These mortgages are typically sold off. So this would be a realistic avenue for increasing cash flow in the future. So the 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 term on the free refi is three years from closing. We'll honor that. So if we if we close, you know, tomorrow, you got three years from that date to come back and do that free refi with us. Uh, I'm not sure I... I fully understand the second part about uh, the mortgages being sold, this and that. We do sell all our loans. Uh, most most mortgage companies will. We service about 50% of our conventional stuff. Uh, that's standard. Regardless of, of you know who it changes hands to with, with servicing, we originally originated the loan for you. So we'll, we will still honor that free refi program. You're still our client, uh, at the end of the day. So three-year limit on it though, is, uh, is, is what the program entails. Somebody else had asked me, I can't remember if it was email or the Facebook group or someone, someone else mentioned about the loans being sold off. So for everyone watching, it doesn't matter what happens to the loan behind it. Like if I get a loan through with Aaron's help, my, 
I just had it happen once actually where the bank actually changed and we had to go through a whole new thing. But for the most part, you, the, what happens with the loan behind the scenes is kind of irrelevant. Is that, that's right, Aaron, right? Uh, yeah. So sorry, I, I got caught up. Uh, it, it, happy to help Armand. Um, but yeah, so, uh, it's completely standard, pretty much every, you know, LO, you know, if you're talking to the Chapman or Chaley or, or whoever, uh, they're doing the same thing. They, uh, you know, half of our company's profits is, you know, we originate these loans and then we sell them and, uh, and, and you, you were selling the servicing rights on them. So yeah, it's completely standard. Anytime you close on a loan with a conventional lender within about 30, 45 days from closing, you're going to receive in the mail, what's called a notice of, uh, trans a notice of service transfer, notice of transfer servicing. Uh, but anyways, you're going to get that in the mail and it's going to say, Hey, we sold your loan or we've retained it. And, you know, here's where you make your new payment out to. And sometimes yes, a loan can get sold more than once. That's not, uh, ours typically only gets sold once, but it can happen sometimes, you know, really no more than twice, but it's not unheard of. Uh, but yeah, regardless of all that, uh, that kind of happens behind the scenes, uh, we're still your LO team. We still, you know, originated the loan. So we'll, we're still your go-to, uh, you know, resource for any lending down the road. Uh, you know, even if it's questions on that property we helped you with, do, should I refi? Should I rate in terms? Should I cash out? We're still there for you. Uh, and that's, you know, going back to Ali about, you know, we, we've worked with so many clients where I start out with one and then, you know, build them up to that 10. For those of you who aren't aware, you can get up to 10 Fannie Mae slots. Once you get outside of that, it is not the end of the world. You go into uh, basically a, a DSCR product or something along uh, those lines, and uh, and we offer that too. Rates are going to be a little bit higher, you know, as we were talking seven and a half for Fannie Mae rates. Your DSCR is going to be eight, eight and a half, uh, you know, with a point or two just just for gauge. But uh, there's still life outside of Fannie Mae. Graham's at. Uh, 43 45 now so he's been you know far over that limit we've got you know lots of good resources on the dscr front just to um, confirm for people who aren't familiar with the dscr term uh debt service coverage ratio that part doesn't matter just know that if you don't qualify for a conventional mortgage dscr is a way to go and we won't get into the details right now but uh what a lot of people don't realize graham and aaron are dscr lenders also so if you don't think you qualify for conventional or you find out you can't or you are over the limit if you do have a spouse that you can do 10 each so that's 20 but mm -hmm. know that you can also talk to aaron about dscr also and armin to uh just say one thing too um as far as realistic avenue for increasing cash flow in the future Absolutely. When I did my 10 year look back, the two biggest things that increased my cash flow, number one was the rent increases. That was hands down the biggest thing. I had, I knew about rent increases, but I completely underestimated them. I If I mapped out all my properties of what they started out with rent and what they're renting for now, it's ridiculous. Um, that's number one. And then number two is when you do a refi, that is part of the strategy. So if you buy a property today and it has a whopping $100 of cash flow, Again, speculation, because if you if the value of your property drops over time, if it just who knows what happens to it, that refi strategy is not going to work, nor are the rent increases going to do much. So this goes back into that. What kind of property do I want to buy to help ensure all of those things have the best best chance of happening? The rent increases appreciation, of course, but also the refi, because you need the value of the property to hold or get higher for that refi. But absolutely, that's a huge cash flow increase tactic. So if anyone if else has- some, oh, And I was ahead. just going to add on that front and, you know, I would, I don't want to overhype now, but as far as the appreciation front down the road, you know, we, it's worked out well for clients in year past. So rates have to be there, but yeah, on that refi down the road, if you got, uh, if rates are low enough, you got enough appreciation, heck you could even pull 15, 20 K out of that house, still have a lower monthly payment, put that towards your next one. So that's a strategy. Yeah. Things have to fall in place for it, but, uh, it's, super viable one that will be there in a couple of years from now. Yeah. Well, if anyone has any last, uh, Armin, I saw you unmute if you have anything. I, I was just going to say thank you uh, to both of you. I had one more question mm -hmm. around Detroit in general um, as a oh, market. Oh, good segue. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. Al, we're, we're keeping I want to get to Al so he's not missing those football games Perfect. for no good reason. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> we'll let you kick off the Detroit question. 
Oh, do you want to start? You want to ask it now? Oh, uh, yeah. So in, in terms of Al, so I have two pieces to this. Number one is how do I go about signing up for the tour October 14th? Yeah. I'm clearly setting it up for you. And then, and then uh, can you just tell us a little bit about the Detroit market just in general, because I'm looking at getting a property there in the next, like literally like signing up for one in the next week or two. And so I'd like to know more about like what businesses or industries are there? What does, what is it, what does the market look like in general? So thank and you. Bef before Al answers that, I'm going to, I'm also looking, we did a, a call, it's been a handful of months. Uh, Al had an amazing slideshow presentation that talks a lot about the industries and the jobs and whatever. I'm going to find that while we're talking and I'll link that in there. Um, but I want to kind of, well, not introduce Al, but kind of introduce Detroit as a possibility and then I'll let Al take over and talk about it. So we're wanting to do, we did an investors tour at the end of March, I think it was this year. And the reason for that was because a lot of people have perceptions about Detroit. And I was one of them when actually Graham called me last fall and he was like, hey, I've got a great guy in Detroit. How do you feel about De De Detroit turnkeys? I was like, awful. What? <laughs> what? Sounds terrible. And I got on the, he was like, well, hear me out. He was like, let me introduce you to Al. I get on the phone with Al and I was like, whatever. Like, tell me, pitch me Detroit. I was like, this guy is foolish. And I was like, whatever. And so Al's like, I hear you. Just let fly out, check it out for yourself. I flew out to Detroit. If you've been following me since then, you know that I am absolutely obsessed with Detroit now for a couple different reasons. Uh, Food. Number uh -huh. Food. Food. Well, I, so let me tell you about Al and his food taste. When you go to Detroit, Al has the best taste in food. He, every restaurant he's taken me to or the investor group, we're all like, Oh, so good. <laughs> like, nice. There's some serious food in Detroit. <laughs> I was like, I love meeting a turnkey provider who's a foodie. Like, I if you want to win me over, <laughs> that works. Um, but just to kind of open up Detroit again, if you guys got the email blast, whatever, you know I've been going on about Detroit for a while. But the reason I like Detroit to kind of segue from what me and Aaron were just talking about into Detroit as a market. All the prices are high across the nation right now. All the turnkey markets, like if you've been shopping for turnkeys, if you've been shopping for investment properties, period, dear God, Florida, like everybody's high priced. And we all know, hopefully we figured out at this point, cash flow is no longer king. And cash flow is not what it used to be. And so what I look for is number one, I still want to find some level of cash flow. But number two, again, those other profit centers, the appreciation, all of that. Detroit, in my mind, I was telling somebody this recently is, you know, I work with turnkey buyers all the time, all the time, buying in all different markets, as does Aaron. And what I've seen right now is that there has to be something unique about the offering for people to buy. People aren't, it seems like people aren't really buying your standard, you know, $200,000 house renting for $1,375. And, you know, it's, I wish they would, but people will kind of want some, they're looking for pizzazz because there's not a lot of pizzazz left really. And right now with where the real estate market is Detroit, I think for me personally has all of that pizzazz. I think it, it is the highest cash flow of any of the turnkeys that I'm working with right now by a pretty decent margin and the appreciation potential in my mind. And Al can kind of speak to this is the highest of everyone. Now, we're not in 2011 where, you know, these massive booms are scheduled across the board, but given how little appreciation is expected generally right now, I think Detroit is in a very unique position to be higher on the appreciation front than a lot of the markets, if not most or all of them. And the reason for that is I'll be honest, when I heard about when I when Al and everyone called and said, you want to come to I was like, this is a shithole. Like I really, you know, there's a perception of Detroit that has been very negative over a good period of time. I'm here to tell you, it is not that at all. And because reality or perception, general perception has not caught up with reality yet. I think that's the unique entry into Detroit because when perception catches up to reality, 
it's off to the races. That kind of goes to what Aaron's saying when interest rates go down. When everyone figures out the state that Detroit is in right now, they're going to swoop. You guys have seen it. If you follow Turnkeys, Frank, you're in St. Louis. Happened in St. Louis. When people figure something out, it's like, and you see the price, you know, like Atlanta, that's where I started buying. That's prohibitive right now. And because people figured it out. Detroit offers, because so many people think it's in bad shape, prices are, it's like, it's a, I'll, I'll let you kind of take over, but it's in a unique position because on one hand, prices are staying a little bit capped because people have per negative perceptions of Detroit. On the other hand, there's been substantial appreciation across Detroit and it's still super affordable. And so the reason I took the, I did the investors tour in March and I want to do another one in October is because I had a negative perception of Detroit. So I was like, look, I don't want anyone believing what I'm saying. Come with me. And Al, I think we had, what, 10, 11 people with us. And I have a video I can share with you guys. Of I was like, all right, tell me what you thought of Detroit before you got here. Now, what do you think? And everybody, hands down, with no exception, was like, whoa. Like, we actually played a game the whole weekend of count how many homeless people we saw. Three total. Three Weekend. homeless people across all of Detroit and zero trash on the ground. Like at one point we were all literally trying to figure out where the trash must go because there's no trash. Detroit is in my, I've been to most of the big cities in the U S I think it's the cutest, safest feeling downtown I've ever been in. There's bike paths, young single people are jogging along them. I mean, there's sports fans everywhere. I mean, it is like, I, Al knows, I'm obsessed with Detroit now. I'm so glad I went there. And to tie it back into, you know, the previous conversation is if you're going to buy property right now, now that you're totally sold on like, oh, I can conquer the interest rates. I got this. Now what do I buy? Detroit, I think, has such a unique offering because of the different dynamics of people don't realize how stinking cute Detroit is mm -hmm. and phenomenal industries are moving in there at a huge rate. Uh, my favorite, Al pointed out an apartment as we drove through downtown that used to rent for 900 and now rents for what, over 3000. Like it's crazy what's going on in Detroit. And there's a, the unique window right now before the rest of the world figures this out. So that's my, I will go on about Detroit forever. I just went what a month or two ago, just for one day to go see Al's new batch of inventory. And I was actually genuinely kind of depressed to leave there. I was like, I'm never scheduling a one day trip here ever again. Cause I love it so much. I didn't want to leave. And I wanted to have Al take me to go eat more food, <laughs> but it's such a great market. So uh, I'll let Al kind of take over and, you know, and I'd say, um, I will link to the, Aaron, can you put your mm -hmm. email address in the chat? Absolutely. Um, absolutely. I will link to the call that we previously did where Al really dives into the details of the dynamics of the market. So we don't need to spend too much time on that, but definitely check that out. But really just kind of what's going on in Detroit right now and how do the Detroit properties play into this investor mindset thing that we're working with of you know, why, why would Detroit fit the bill for what somebody wants for a good investment property right now? And just yeah, kind of I'll, touch, I'll, I'll touch a little bit on the surface of, of, you know, not getting into a deep dive because it's like, where do I start? You know, you, you when you were going off, Ellie, there was so many things going off in my head and I was like, yeah, she's right. Yeah, she's right. Yeah. I want to talk about that. But one of the main things that I, I always like to talk about is the affordability Many people know Detroit as the Motor City and, you know, the backbone of this the, the city is obviously, you know, the car industry. But with the innovation of all the electric motor and now they just revealed De Detroit is the first city to reveal a flying car. I don't know if you guys seen it in the news or not. But anyways, um, there's been a transition in uh, the backbone of Detroit. It's not all auto industry anymore. And with all of the new tech industrial jobs that have been coming up into Detroit, they're now ranked in the top 15 city in the country for new tech, uh, tech industrial jobs being developed. So you have Google, Microsoft, Tesla, uh, Jeep manufacturing, all these tier one, tier two, and tier three employers that have been flocking into Detroit, taking um, advantage of a lot of these business tax incentives that the government's been offering. It's been a pretty cool uh, 
um, revitalization in the last decade to see what the heck has been happening in downtown Detroit. And not only for me, um, I, I recognize a couple of the names and faces in here, people like Calvin, he's from Detroit himself. And, you know, I'm sure he can probably piggyback on what I'm saying in regards to what's happening in downtown Detroit. You know, I've gone through downtown Detroit countless of times, and I recall almost every single time in the past, like 10 years, every time I went down there and I'd go down there like once a week or whatever, um, and I'm only like 20 minutes away from there, but I'd go down there, whether it was for dinner with my family or I'm on a, you know, tour with the client flying in to see properties. I would always recognize something new that was going on in downtown Detroit. One of my favorite things as of recent is all the cool events that have been happening in downtown Detroit. For example, coming up in April, we have the NFL draft. Um, that's going to be being hosted in Detroit. We just had, um, the, what do they call that? WWE SummerSlam. We have now talks of a potential Super Bowl. We have, uh, we already had a Super Bowl. We're getting our second Super Bowl. And, people... and while you're on the sports, you're about to get, you're about to be the only city in the nation with all five major sports teams. Yeah, we are going to be hopefully very soon going to be having a major league soccer team. And what Ali's talking about is having all five major league, five major sports in their downtown area. So all their stadiums are literally in walking distance away from each other. Right now, they're like have... literally next door to each other. So it's pretty cool. Like you can literally get out from one game and walk across the street and catch another game. So there isn't too many, you know, cities right now in the country that can offer you that. Um, and people don't realize how big of a sports town Detroit is. One of my other favorite things about Detroit that I like to talk about is affordability. Detroit is the number one city to live in with a household income of $60,000 and under. Now, for the people that's on this call, you and I being an investor, what does that mean for us? Well, that means that we could capitalize on, you know, using somebody like Aaron jumping onto these prices that you can pick up properties for under 150, well under $150,000. And still be near that 1% rule that everybody likes to see their cash flow, which is what Allie was talking about earlier. For the record, Al's properties are the closest to yeah. the 1% rule that I know of at, for B class. There's some Illinois side St. Louis ones that beat the 1% rule, but it's a different class. But Detroit is the only solid, all, like nearing super close to 1% rule, just to clarify. There'd be a lot of times that when Allie was out here for a tour and I was showing her the inventory and stuff, she'd be like, Al, there's no way we're in Detroit. Are you sure we're not in a suburb? I'm like, no, no, no. This is, you know, this is Detroit. And she fell in love with a lot of these properties that were, you know, these beautiful brick architectural structures that are all characteristically shaped differently when you're driving down some of these streets and some of these subdivisions that are in Detroit um, you wouldn't believe that if you picked up one of these properties and put them into maybe one of your neighborhoods where you guys live, you're talking millions of dollars, yeah. and, you know, for, for a mere 130, $140,000 that are renting for, like I said, near 1% rule, there's not too many markets in the country that can withstand or stand toe to toe with Detroit's number for number. So hey, I want to throw something in just cause it's burning in my head. Cause I'm so excited about it. And it, kind of relates to what you're saying. So Detroit already has the cash flow. Detroit already has the purchase price, but <laughs> this sounds so dumb, but it's such a big thing after owning rental properties. A little bit of a sidebar, but it's extremely standard in Detroit for tenants to travel with their own appliances, including their oven and their stove. I personally can't picture this. That sounds, aw I hate moving already. I can't imagine moving my own freaking stove. But tenants travel with their own stoves, refrigerators, the major appliances. What does that mean for you? You as the landlord don't have to pay to fix those, which is number one. And number two, it's also incredibly standard for the whole state of Michigan that properties get sold without air conditioning. Like it's just not, you know, I'm from Georgia. I personally cannot fathom not having air conditioning, but in Michigan, it's standard. So a lot of the properties, if not the majority that Al sells, don't come with air conditioning, which is also less expense to you as the owner. So not only are we teetering the 1% rule, not only are we like raking in appreciation potential in my speculative opinion, but also you're decreasing your expenses as an owner, which now having had my properties for 10 years, those expenses suck. <laughs> like it truly. And so like, these are, it's again, I've never seen this where tenants bring all their own appliances and there's no air conditioning and that's standard and normal. And so therefore you don't have to pay to fix any of that. 
it's one of those little nuggets that I actually go to bed smiling thinking I'm like, oh man, <laughs> it's so good. So I just want to, you know, to really drive home the, you know, cash flow, that kind of potential. And I, and I love what you just said. And, and, you know, to, to put a little cherry on top, it's all affordable. It's all at an affordable cost. And going back to what I was just saying a second ago, you know, Detroit's the, you know, number one city to live in with a household income of $60,000 and under. And what I was going to was, what does that mean to people like you and I? Um, that's also going to be uh, an, uh, maybe I would say an entryway to beginners, maybe first time buyers, first time investors, or just not really sure about Detroit or whatnot. This is an awesome entry level type market to get into. And if you are a seasoned investor on the flip side and you're looking to maybe your portfolio, you already have a handful of properties in there and looking to improve your cash flow numbers, then bonus to you too, because Detroit is like Ali was saying, is one of the best cash flowing markets in the country. And she's su- like she's awesome when it comes to knowing what's going on in the market, what's going on with turnkey, what's going on in this. That all translates to who's bitching about what is what I'm up on. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and I want to I want to come back to Detroit as a market, and I'll say this again at the end. But what we want to do is do another investors tour. So the reason I did it in March was I wanted to get a handful of people. I was like, guys, I want you to come with me and see if I'm imagining all of this and see what other people think because most of the markets that people bought turnkeys in, people are familiar with the market. They feel good about it. They don't really feel a need to see it. So people aren't necessarily feeling that way about Detroit because they're like, oh, I've heard horror stories. So we took everyone there. We had a blast. Calvin was there. Marcus was there. And I'll see if any of them want to <clears throat> chime in. Uh, oh, Marcus is at work. He won't be able to chime in. But Calvin might be able to speak to it. But so we're planning to do another investors tour the weekend of October 14th. And the short of how it works is Friday, when everyone flies in around 6 p.m., usually we'll just do a casual eat, happy hour, just kind of everyone who's there. Some people don't get in until a little bit later, hang out, get to know. It's really fun uh, just meeting everyone all day on Saturday, the 14th. We'll do property tour. We'll tour downtown Detroit. And then Sunday, even Saturday night, if you have to fly out or Sunday, you can fly out anytime. And so that's the weekend of October 14th. If you are interested, let me know ASAP because we need to figure out numbers. You know, we we need to know logistics because it's coming up soon. But the one thing I wanted to say about pitching the trip, even if you are not told, like if you know you want to buy a property in Detroit, like Armand, if you're you're like, I'm ready, show me the show me the inventory, come on the trip. But also there's more to the trips than just seeing the properties and just seeing downtown. In my experience, being around like-minded people, like everyone on this call right now, we're all somewhat similar in our goals. We're trying to do the same thing. Despite what people think, real estate is not an individual sport. I think it's more fun as a team sport. And uh, Marcus can't chime in because he is at work, but maybe Calvin can chime in, is when you get around people who were all trying to do that. We had a, Calvin, did we have a blast? We had a blast. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> we, had, absolutely. we were line yeah. dancing, for God's sake. Right. It was good to meet you. I didn't get to go a whole lot with everything. I had a bunch of little things going on, but um, I was really excited to see all of you and shake your hand, and especially Al, and um, highly motivating. Uh, that's why I'm ready to go on the second trip here. Uh, yeah. And, so, you know, to me, a lot of people, I and Aaron probably has numbers on this too. I'd say probably 95% of the people I work with buy turnkeys sight unseen. And they just, I, I don't want anyone to trust anything I say. I don't want you to think Detroit's amazing just because I said so or Al says so. I think, you know, one of the biggest conversations with turnkeys and any should be with any investment is the conversation about due diligence. You can research and get the stats and the data till the cows come home. But I think there's no better method of due diligence than your own eyeballs. When you get into a city and this, whether it's Detroit or St. Louis or wherever, and you see the properties for yourself, you see the neighborhoods for yourself, you meet Al and you're like, oh, you're real. I mean, how do we know Al's not some AI bot, right? You know, we don't, we don't know. We're scamming you. (laughs) And so like, that's what the value of these trips are. Aside from you get to meet a lot of like-minded investors. It's because I've always done it by myself and I love everybody. I love meeting people on the trip. We all had, we had such a blast in March. So I want to get back to Detroit as a market and talk about the properties, but that's my first pitch is 
that's kind of the skivvy on this investors tours. We want to do it again. I want to start doing them probably twice a year, honestly. Um, and Al is such a great host. <laughs> we had a lot of the investors who were buying in other markets too. And they're like, hey, can you get, you know, the other provider to do a trip? I was like, yes. And Al set the bar high. Like he, <laughs> he, I was like, you know, a lot of turnkey providers are, and this is kind of a pitch for Al, well, all of the turnkey providers mostly are, God, I love them, phenomenal, great people. They're really good at what they do, but they can be very ADD and ungrounded. If you've bought turnkeys, you've probably experienced this. It's just part of what comes with the territory. Al is honestly the first turnkey provider I've met that is so grounded and can actually multitask and communicate. It's baffling to me. <laughs> like, and he set this trip up. I mean, we had goodie bags. It was organized. We had a van that we all rode in to go see the properties, took us out to the best restaurant. I mean, not even the fancy, like the best tasting restaurants. They were phenomenal. So if you're ever going to do an investor's tour like this, Detroit is the place to go aside from the amazing part of the market. But Al, I'll let you kind of take back over now that I've thrown my pitch for the trip out. Thank you. Absolutely. We're, I mean, we're super excited. Obviously, that's why we're having this call. We want you guys all to come. Um, and and it's a, it's a great time. Just it, even sometimes you're like, hey, I, I want to come. I may not buy. I may not be ready to buy. This is still a great opportunity for you guys just to be as, as an eye-opening experience because you may need that little nudge to, okay, you know what? This does line up with what I'm looking for. And this, like I said, is a great opportunity for you guys to 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 you know get over the nudge to to pull the trigger. And a lot of times, oh sorry, Al, and to just expand on that real quick too is that if you're brand new, it's also a, kind of what Al was just saying, but it's also an opportunity to learn what you don't know right now. You know, when you first get started, there's so much that you don't know that you don't know, and how do you figure out what that is? And then once you know you need to know something, how do you actually? learn how to do it. And a lot of that, in my opinion, becomes a lot more clear when you're in person. And like when we're actually in a house, like a pre-rehab house or a rehabbed house or whatever, the questions that come up, I've seen, my experience has been, and I've seen with a lot of other people, a lot of the bigger picture of investing and turnkeys and how all this works becomes a lot more clear because all the pieces are right in front of you. And you're not just sitting, you know, back with a keyboard of like, oh, this is really nerve wracking. Like we're, you're buying a property via the internet. What could go wrong there? And so if you're newer and you just have questions and you want to use it as a learning trip, phenomenal. I think there's no better place to learn that much that quickly and have fun while you're doing it. Yeah. What I, go ahead, Al. No, no, please, man. No, I was just, just going to say uh, to echo on that, uh, there's no perfect way to invest, right? There's no clear cut strategy that's, and the, the, what I love about trips like this is it's just the, it just comes out in osmosis. You learn a different strategies. What are people doing? And and there's no, you know, this is the way you have to do it. And then here, 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 it's, it's, you just, you take all this information, you adapt and you pull those pieces uh, that, you know, fit your, you know, personal situation, your goals. And uh, yeah, I love, I love, uh, love trips like that. Yeah. They're fun. They're a lot Aaron, of are you free October 14th? So I've got my first <laughs> born coming the first week of November. Oh, so I, think I can't I'll, argue uh, that one. Congrats. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I think I, I don't think I'm allowed to. Uh, so, so you know, what's funny is I actually one. have, there's a handful of people that were wanting to go on the trip and they're all, they all have firstborns coming. Right. Where I'm like, what's going on in October? <laughs> <laughs> October, November, go figure. <laughs> well, it's, uh, it's not only that, Ali. I think it's also with these trips. A lot of times, I find a lot of people exchanging numbers amongst each other. Oh yeah, from one another and stuff like that. And I think that this is a really cool experience for investors to come on board. So once again, you know, I don't want to keep boring you guys, but I highly, highly, highly recommend client uh, investor tours like this. I think this is a great opportunity for you guys to get a better understanding of, of, of the market and what the heck is going on on here and why is everybody here and uh, where's the revitalization happening and where are these properties at? What do these, some of these neighborhoods look like? Because when you go on Google or you go on some of these other sources and you look up Detroit or some of the things you may have heard or watched or read, 
most of the stuff you may hear probably will be Detroit's a ghost town, Detroit's a war zone, like Ali was talking about earlier. And then you actually get out here and you see it for yourself and you're like, hang on, where's where's all these crazy places I read about? And then And then you start realizing there's so many news articles bragging about Detroit now too, which is kind of that's that's kind of unique in itself. Like there's not a lot of cities that get bragged about to the level that Detroit, I think, is. And to echo what uh, Al said about like people exchanging numbers. So on the Friday night of the last trip, we accidentally ended up at what might be my favorite bar of all time. It was a pool hall. Turned out there was line dancing. So at some point, most of us were doing the wobble. And so now after the trip, everyone, everyone just clicked and got along so well. We actually have a WhatsApp group with everyone from the trip called the Detroit Wobblers. And and even just a little while ago, some people were messaging on it. So it's not even just making new friends and meeting new people on the trip, but it's ongoing. Like as so pretty much everybody who wanted to buy a property who was on the trip last time ended up buying a property from Al. Everybody, I mean, it was it was across the board. Everybody was super excited. All the properties got taken up. And so over the course of the next one to three months or however long as they were going through the process, as everybody was going through the process of you know, inspection reports, due diligence, questions come up. They were able, they put the, they put their, you know, questions or whatever in the Detroit Wobblers WhatsApp group because everyone was doing the same thing at the same time. And they're like, hey, I had this thing come up on the inspection report. What do you guys think of this? And so it's been on, I mean, we're now what six, seven months later. And everyone from that trip is still there. Everyone's still in communication and helping each other out. So now you have a group of people who are all buying Detroit properties at the same time, and they're not doing it now by themselves. Chet just got on the call. I don't know if Chet's open to um, getting on the microphone, uh, but if he is, he was also on the uh, call or the call, the investors tour. But yeah, it's like ongoing. You meet people and you become friends what can be for a lifetime, you know, everybody's still in touch and to have people, when you go through the turnkey process and probably any investment property process, especially the, for the first time, when you don't exactly know what's supposed to be happening or you don't exactly know how it's going to go to have other people to be like, is this normal? Like you would, you'd be surprised at how nice that is. Cause you don't want to call Al and ask if it's normal because what's Al going to tell you, you know, like you want someone who's going nice through to it, hear like, from those other investors yeah, you know, going the through the non-biased you know. people like, Oh yeah, that's totally Absolutely. normal. 100%. Absolutely. So going back to what we were just talking about a second ago about Detroit, um, we were just diving in a little bit more about the numbers and neighborhoods and where we're investing. And, you know, like I said, some of these neighborhoods, you really wouldn't recognize or tie them to a city like Detroit. And I think coming out here firsthand, seeing it, it's it's a pretty cool experience and pretty neat to to do a before and after from when you got here, like we did on our last tour uh, on what your thoughts are about the city. But um, Ali, do we want to jump into some numbers and talk about some properties, or 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 do you want to just kind of keep this, uh, you know, open discussion going? Do you mind? Do you mind if I talk about a property? No, absolutely, go for it. So I was thinking when you were talking a second ago, I I everybody's been on here now for ninety minutes or so, and I kind of want to make on it a Saturday during college football, two hours. Are we kind of no? Or, yeah. Wait, I see. Yeah, hour and a half. <laughs> time worthwhile. And I want to make an offer for anybody that buys in Detroit, for, for whoever's on this call, I want to offer them free property management for one year. I mean, everybody's been here for 90 minutes and we got everybody's attention and everybody seems pretty intrigued on investing. Absolutely. I see some hearts flowing in. So for the record, I didn't know he was going to offer that. So no, we didn't we, this was not pre-planned. <laughs> you know, I, I just, I really appreciate everybody's time. And um, I, I want to reciprocate that by doing something for everyone else and offering free property management for a year. And uh, Aaron kind of did his part. He's doing something for three years. So I think it's it's nice for us to kind of reciprocate and do the same thing for you guys as well. And I don't want to make official claims or give numbers, but if you come on the trip, we usually work with you to, we want to cover your trip costs to some extent. So that's more, you know, if you come on the trip, there'll be more incentives than just, you know, today's uh, thing. But also, you know, that's a little bit of a segue not to take a, like, amazing. And that prompts me to think that people probably have property management questions. Just the short on the property managers, because ultimately, 
at the end of the day, it doesn't matter who you buy a property from. The property matters, but almost it almost doesn't matter as much as the property management. In my experience, the property managers are the make or break. Every big expense I've had has been directly, usually because of the property. Like it's, it is integral for your long-term profits. And so we won't dive into major details right now, but the property managers that Al is working with, it's a third party manager. I think most people are off this thing about wanting in-house management. I'm I'm usually pretty opposed to in-house management. I prefer hundred percent. I prefer third party ma uh, property managers in most cases, shy of a couple turnkey providers. And the, the I'll let Al kind of talk about it, but uh, they've been working with this particular property manager for what, two and a half years, something like that. They've, knock on wood, they've yet to have had an eviction. And my role with people, when people buy turnkeys, I'm the one who gets to hear everything later. Usually people reach out with bad news. They don't really reach out with the good news. And again, knock on wood, I have not heard one thing from, in my case, when I don't hear from people, it's actually really good news I because I always hear the bad stuff. I haven't had one person who's bought in Detroit come to me complaining about the property management. In every other market that I've ever worked with turnkeys, there are people they are like, well, they don't really communicate that great, or I can't get this from them. Or, There's just something being talked about with the property managers. It has been dead quiet on the property management complaint front, if if I want to call it that, for the Detroit properties. It's still a little bit early on. It's, you know, we're not three, five years in, but the property managers on Detroit, like I almost always tell people, or I always tell people you should interview multiple property managers and make sure you're working with who you like. But in the Detroit case, I actually feel more comfortable. Most people don't listen to me. Let's be honest. And it makes me really antsy because then if something happens later, I'm like, oh, but I told you to yeah, like, you know, <laughs> and I don't worry about that with Detroit because their their property managers actually came out on the investor tour in March. We got to meet them in person and so far, no complaints. So just to not only if Al's offering a year for them to cover your property management fee, the property managers on these properties are really kind of top tier for what I've seen as far as managers who come with turnkeys. And you can always still use your own if you want to, but the ones Al's working with are pretty notable. Absolutely. Uh, did you, uh, oh, go ahead. Oh, no. Um, do you, you, we're about to talk about numbers a little bit. Do you, I have a couple properties pulled up. Do you want, what do you want to, you want to yeah, show? I, I, go ahead. Just, Toss me up some slides. I'll start blabbing off about them. Maybe talking about uh, certain properties, specific properties, specific neighborhoods, numbers. You put it up on the screen and I'll, I'll take over. I love that you think I have slides, that I'm that good. However, uh, <laughs> the first property I want to show you just, I believe, went under contract, but it's also my favorite picture. Um, share. Can you guys see that? Oh, nice. Okay, so this one, Al can tell you a little bit about this one. Maybe just tell us about the neighborhood while you're doing that. I will pull up the pro forma. Uh, but this is, so the cool thing, what I really love about this property is that I saw it, pre, I think we saw it pre-rehab on the investors tour. And then when I just went back a month or so ago, I got to see it post-rehab. And I have a video a tour of that I did uh, walking through it that I can share with you guys if you want. But Al, if you want to tell us about, it's just, it's kind of one of my favorites. So I wanted to show it. Yeah, so this property, I actually, you know, was one of my favorites too. Um, for some of the reasons being is the location and the neighborhood that's in it. It's, it's, it's probably maybe just a few streets away from some of the tier one subdivisions like Rosedale Park and Grandmon subdivision. Some of this stuff might be gibberish to you guys, but when you come out here, you'll know what I'm talking about. Uh, where some of those other subdivisions that are really close by sell properties for, I'd say double and triple of what this sold. And this was like $140,000. This one's 135. Yeah. Yeah. 135. And, and some of those other properties, like I said, are double and triple that are being sold just, you know, the next subdivision over. And, and uh, with, with those properties he's talking about, we saw it on the tour. Everyone got to see it, that uh, 
those properties used to be at 135,000 and now they're over two and 300,000. So like the, a lot of the properties, one thing I love about where, how Al picks properties. So he's now doing properties in the 135,000 range that are literally across the street from the ones that used to be 135 and now they're two and 300,000. So yes. I think that's a, an amazing play on strategy in terms of helping with that appreciation bar, helping with the rent increases, like to buy near the things, the other properties that used to be at that price and are, and have since gone up. Absolutely. And I think that's another, like you said, strategy that we like to use to make these numbers work for everybody that's involved. And uh, we capitalize on buying these type of properties that are, you know, no vacancies, no vacant lots, no burn downs. Um, we, we really try to target a, a up and coming neighborhood. It could be established, of course, which is now you're going to start getting into your upper B class, lower A class type of areas. But on a property like this, three bedrooms, one bath, I think it's like, I forgot the square feet, but 1660, I, which is literally bigger than my first house I bought for myself. Yeah, that's nice size. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's really good size. And one of my favorite things is this was a copycat type of subdivision. So every single house on this street is all also characteristically shaped different. And you could even look at the two houses that are side by side. Those are two different types of houses. One's a bungalow and the other one's a colonial. And this is like a two door. So it's, it's really nice to see when you're driving down the street. Okay. This is all brick. Okay. This one is stone and brick. Okay. This has front door, side door. They're all literally different. And I love that. So in this property in particular, it already has a tenant that moved in as well. This one got 1300 and yeah, they just moved in. I'm just I can, um, oops, that was when I did the video. 1300 on a 135 purchase price. That is awesome. I'm going to share the pro forma because I have that policy where this is pressed, right? I want, I'm, I'm pretty sure it was 13. I don't know why I'm thinking more, but I think it was 13 to be safe. I I, I don't know. Let's stick with 13 to be safe. So here's the 1660 for square feet, 135 purchase price, 1300 for the rent. And then the cash flow number. So I have this set at six and a half percent interest rate, which we know is not accurate. I'll change it to seven and a half in a second. But one reason that I haven't updated Anytime, if you guys email, I'll send you this editable thing so you can play around. So like we can put uh, 7.5 in there with 25% down. So you'll see the cash flow on that after the mortgage is still 108, which again, for the last 10 years, doesn't seem like a lot, but for where everything is right now, that's actually amazing. But if the reason I decided to leave six and a half in there is because again, if you're having the seven and a half percent interest rate, if that goes down, like Aaron's been talking about, I wanted to give people a better perception of how that cash flow changes just with the one point um, interest rate change. So then you're up to 176. And so over here in the green, their cap rate and cash on cash, 7.44. Again, when I started buying turnkeys, cash on cash is really like 14%, but they're not now. And so now, honestly, anything even in the 7% range is actually pretty high. If you've, especially Aaron, you can speak to it. Those Florida properties are like 1% <laughs> cash on cash on a good day. That's being generous. And, you know, if you really shop around turnkeys, you'll know that 7.44% cash on cash is actually pretty substantial for what's available now. And you're combining that with all of the other profit centers, which I think personally are pretty big for Detroit. Yeah. And especially you factor in that uh, free year property management Al was throwing out too. And yeah, that's for, you know, your first year. Oh, uh, you let's take advantage play with of that. that. Let's but see. yeah, first I mean, year. talk about improving cash flow for that first year, then, you know, Oops. might have a year more at that seven and a half rate, and then you refine out of that. So, I mean, uh, very important, in my opinion, to always look at the actual dollars and cents, just like we're doing now, because, uh, you know, you when you come across a good property like this, you can see it pretty quickly. So if I change, I took the property management fee out and then I also changed it to seven and a half percent. So like today's what you'd be getting. And this is, don't forget that uh, vacancy and maintenance are in here. Those are not taken out. So you would actually be getting, so we always want to put those in to make our cash on cash more realistic. In this case with free property management for a year, you're looking at 9% cash on cash, but like actual take home, let's see. Uh, <laughs> Where's 
So actual take home for the first year at a seven and a half percent interest rate, uh, assuming no actual maintenance happens, uh, we're talking 355 for the cash flow, and that's a 13% cash on cash return for the first year. So then let's say that the management fee, uh-oh, now I deleted and I forgot what it is. Um, what was this? Oh, management fee, uh, 130. Uh, something, let's see. I'm sorry, it's 9%, it's less. What am I talking about? Uh, what is, do you have the, what does that translate to? Let's see, we'll just keep going back here. Do, do, do. 17. I was okay, going to guess 117. <laughs> <laughs> How many people does it take to, let's see. So property management fees back in there. And let's say a year from now, it does go down to 6.5. Um, let's see what I'm, so property management fee is back in there. So actual take home, if the rate goes down to 6.5, now you're up to 306 cash flow a month and still 11 and a half percent. That's with paying the property management. And then if the vacancy and, uh, maintenance come back for averages. Um, we're back to 176 and 7.44, just to kind of give you an idea of the numbers. And what's nice there is it was already sitting really pretty before we even, you know, backed out some of those, you know, conservative. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Does anyone have any questions on like, well, let me do one more quick screen share just to give you an idea. This is a different property, but we we didn't get the after rehab pictures of that particular property because um, it rented and sold too fast. But here's just to kind of give you guys, oops, give you guys an idea of the rehab quality that Al offers. So Al can kind of speak a little bit more to everything they do. But here's some of the yeah. yeah. So as you can see, this bathroom, you know, totally redone, uh, new vanity, new, new toilet, new shower, new tub. You know, we we do the uh, what do they call the tile surround? You know, has that little hotel feel. So it's really nice, really clean. Most Looks of like that nice laminate flooring in there too. If I'm yeah, that's if a I saw correctly. Yeah, that's a vinyl plank flooring actually. Um, yeah. Or vinyl. Yeah, sorry, my apologies. I'm a big fan of that stuff. It's Is that so in the bathroom you're looking and, at. Yeah. Uh, oops, let's see, kind of losing spots here. Yeah, you can, there, there's still a little bit of construction material in here, but you guys can get an idea of the kitchen. Uh, Al can talk to LVP flooring, see that missing, uh, range and stove, my favorite thing. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I hate taking care of appliances and rental properties. And then most of the properties have basements, which have gigantic spaces. Um, Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is just a quick little snapshot, guys, of some of the rehabs that we do, some of the quality rehabs that we offer. Um, we also go to the extent of hardwood floors. They get resanded, stained, polyurethane. You know, obviously, we're always shooting for some sort of durability. Uh, if not, we try to veer over to vinyl plank flooring. And if not, worst case scenario, we will put carpet in the property if we have to. But Calvin can piggyback on this too, being here in Michigan, living here in Michigan, in the Midwest, it's very, very common to see carpet and properties, especially the bedroom, you know, yeah. where it's kind of keeping nice and warm and tidy. So uh, is it a deal breaker? No, not at all. Is it going to bring me more rent if I have hardwood versus not? No, it's not. So I just want to. And Dustin had asked what class house this was. So most of the houses that Al does are B class neighborhoods. Uh, there's only been one C property. I almost bought it. I was very close to getting it myself. I loved it. Um, and then occasionally there's some B pluses, but even the Bs are really solid. Um, and then, oh, and one thing, let's see, what was I? Uh, oh, the other thing I love that you guys have probably heard me say, if you've heard me talking about Detroit, is I love, there are some houses with siding, but there's so many brick houses. Yet again, something I don't have to spend money on. I've had to do a lot of siding stuff on my rental properties, and I find it very annoying. So again, when you have a brick house with none of the appliances under your own ownership, you have LVPs and no air conditioning, the CapEx on just those things alone is huge and it's all off your plates. And Al Armin was asking if you have partnered with any clients to do Berkey's. Oh, you answered. Just kidding. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, actually all the time. That's yeah, very common that we do that. 
We, you we, guys, we I cannot live. express how much you guys rock. Yeah, we we oh, do. Thanks. <laughs> And and one thing I was gonna uh, add to, uh, if if anyone wants a uh, you know want more information about the Detroit area, want to know what the actual uh, you know estimate would look like from R and yes, we talked rates, we went over that. But as far as you know, all the other closing costs that might factor in uh, you know into a potential purchase, uh, you know in Detroit. We're, you know, we're your go-to for that. We're happy to, you know, send over if you've got, you know, one of these, uh, you, you know, you're scouring Al's website and, and got a pro forma or something in mind, shoot it over and we can, you know, get you over and estimate that way you can be, you know, even more prepared for that market as far as, you know, uh, and as far as when you look at all, like, like Florida, for example, has a large transfer tax that is not always covered by the seller, things like that. Michigan, as far as, you know, property taxes, state fees, things like that. It's a really great market for that is on the low end of those similar to uh, like your Kansas City or, uh, you know, uh, even Memphis market is a little bit more pricey, in my opinion, as far as the state fees and stuff. So where your go to for that as well, we can give you, you know, a, a, a nice conservative estimate on, you know, what kind of the all in costs would look like, you know, of course, separate from the property management things that would be inside the lending transaction, but for that actual purchase, uh, you know, where your go to for that as well. And just so y'all know too, Aaron and Graham have been working with Al for a pretty long time. Like they've, they, I five, met Al because now, of Graham. Yeah. And so like when you have the, everybody's, it, it really is like a team feel. It's not like, it's, it's just, I don't know. It's just different. Like everybody likes each other, you know, Aaron and Graham trust Al, Al trust them. You know, they get the loans closed. He provides the properties that are in good shape. Um, you know, me and Aaron and Graham and everybody, we won't, if I know a turnkey provider is offering bad quality, whatever, and sometimes it changes oh, yeah. over time, but like, you know, it, it matters to us who we're working with and we all love Al. If that, you know, again, that's mm -hmm. not what you should use in your final due diligence checklist by any stretch, <laughs> but you know, there's a reason that we're all working together and it's, 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 it's been a really graceful experience. And I know a couple of the wobblers in case anyone missed my speech about the trip people were the Detroit wobblers on WhatsApp. <laughs> uh, everyone has bragged about working with Al after the inspection reports, like inspection reports can be pretty intimidating. And Al has been just amazing to work with. Like he'll sit down on a zoom call with you and you guys go line by line of everything that shows up. And I've never known a turnkey provider to ever do that. It's a wonder if they'll call you back, much less hop on a zoom call. and like, Hey, let's go through it together and get it up to, you know, the quality you want to, we want to make sure it is what you're expecting. So yeah, that's, you know, just a testament to Alan, what he does. You know, that's one thing I, I heard you talk about earlier, like property managers make or break a hundred percent. I agree, but it's also the people you deal with is, is tremendously just as important as the property you're buying. That goes for working with Ali, working with Aaron, working with myself, this is this is also a huge deciding factor on whether this is something that's going to work for you or not. And I can't stress that enough. Uh, I have people that still call me that bought properties years ago. Al, hey, I had this property. I had this problem in my property. Can you help me? And I always tell them like, hey, if I can't help you, I'm at least going to pick up my phone and call somebody that can help you. So relationships is something that you know, the, the, the bond that we're going to create together isn't something that we're just going to close the door on after we make a sale. And it's, it's something that is literally just opening the door. And I call that, you know, building a relationship for hopefully tens of years will equate to tens of properties for you guys. And I want to be a part of that and, you know, vice versa. So I know Ali and I are on the same page with that. And I can speak for Aaron for when it goes to longstanding relationships with investors that we've worked with. So I can't stress that enough, how important I, I really value the relationships and communication that we put together uh, for you guys to make sure that this works for, for everyone that's involved. Do you, uh, Armin, I saw your thing. I'm going to, so a quick little funny story. Uh, I just hired someone new. I haven't been able to keep up with putting new properties on the website at all. And I'm literally in the trial period with a new person to do this. So if any of these are goobered up, 
his first run at putting properties on my website was literally last night. Um, I'm going to give you a link to some of the available properties here of Al's. Um, let's see. Actually, I give you, I shouldn't have given you page two. Let me give you. So if there's weird things, just know I'm in the process of, I didn't do some of these myself. Um, uh, I'll let Al tell you, actually, I need to, Prest is already, it's under contract, right? Yeah. I need to update that one. So when you go on this link, Freeland uh, doesn't have a good front picture, but you'll be able to see some interior pictures if you click on that one. Uh, I've got a video. Actually, I think he put Freeland twice. So Freeland, Prevost, uh, Buckingham. These also aren't in order of what's actually available either. Um, let's see, what do we have? Al, there's, and think. all the numbers are in there also. Prevost, Aubrey, Freel. Aubrey. Yeah, those three, for sure, I can speak for and say that those are available for sure. And yeah. Aubrey, I think if you, so uh, just a quick, I don't want even want to dive into this because I want to kind of open it up for anyone to ask anything about anything. Um, but one thing I learned about Detroit that is very different from what my experience with cities has been, I'm used to there being like a little tiny metro area and then all the suburbs, like that's kind of a typical city setup. Detroit is different where Detroit Metro is most of the area. And then there's like kind of more of a thin veil of suburbs. I, I don't know if that's exactly accurate, but like it's in most cities, if someone said I was buying in the Metro area, I'd be kind of nervous. Like, Oh, that doesn't sound very good. But Detroit Metro is huge, but occasionally somebody comes in and they just don't want Detroit Metro for whatever reason. And they want suburbs, which there's pros and cons. Like, the really nice neighborhoods, your property taxes are going to be higher. You know, it's a little bit different dynamics in different areas, but uh, Al Aubrey is a suburb, right? Like, was that, yeah. So Aubrey was an amazing suburban property, which in Detroit isn't a huge difference like it is in others, but Aubrey was amazing when I saw it. And there should be a video. Um, actually, I don't think I got video at Aubrey because the previous tenants weren't moved out yet. Um, yeah. And then at some point, Al, if you want to put your, or actually anyone who wants to get in touch with Al, email me. And what I'll do is I'll copy Al on the uh, email back. So I just put my email in the chat for anyone who doesn't see the chat in the replay, Ali, A-L-I at hipsterinvestments.com. And then I'll copy Al and Aaron, if you want also, if you're looking yeah, for a yeah, that. Yeah, I was going to say if we could, you know, distribute my information or if they just want to get in touch with you and then you can link them to me directly mm -hmm. for any questions. And and yeah, one uh, other thing I didn't touch on kind of from our end as far as, you know, as a buyer wanting to be prepared for going into the market, whatever, the first step for us would be, of course, getting pre-qualified. So that just starts with completing our online application takes like five minutes, uh, just gives us the blueprint. From there, we ask you for, you know, the things of documentation. W-2s, pay stubs, bank statements. We do self-employed too, uh, all of that. So once you get us, that uh, takes us about one to two days and we've got your pre-approval out. We know what you qualify for. If you, you know, target and buy in multiple at once or one, you know, every quarter or one every year for at that point, we've got all that information to kind of do a deep dive with you on your strategy. Uh, but yeah, it all starts basically, uh, you know, with the loan application. And then that kind of unlocks the keys to all your borrowing power, uh, you know, as the buyer. And of course, you know, if, if you're, Completing the loan application doesn't uh, obligate, doesn't, it's it's free, you know, all that good stuff. So it could be one of those things where even if you're still hesitant for buying in the next couple of years, we'll at least figure out maybe what you could get qualified for. And uh, and then you can kind of go back and evaluate options, but real easy uh, process, free process, just to find out, uh, you know, what you can do at, at the end of the day. Thanks, Aaron. Aaron how long does that pre-approval last? Yeah, that, that's a great question, Calvin. So it's essentially indefinite as long as, you know, big things don't change in your personal situation. Technically, it is, uh, it, it does require a hard credit pool. 
So that's going to be valid for 120 days. And uh, even if you're, you know, buying multiple properties within that 100 days, or you get pre-approved today, and then 60 days from now, you bring us a contract, said, let's go. We're still using that same credit report. Uh, we're not repulling. There's no need to. Uh, so yeah, it's essentially good for 120 days or so, indefinite, unless you go buy a boat or another house or something like that. Please then we don't change to, jobs while you're in the middle anywhere. of the mortgage process. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> just, kind of, just wait until yeah. the more, the, until it closes. <laughs> That would be our request. <laughs> so we're coming up. Thank you all for, especially everyone who hung in this long. We're coming up in the two hour mark. So what I want to do oh, is wow. completely open it up. I know if I looked at the time. I was like, wait, seriously? I would um, like to jump in and say if there's any uh, questions for Detroit, because I actually need to jump off myself. Okay. So any Detroit questions, let's do those first. And then after that, if you have questions for Aaron, let's do those. And then also too, if anyone wants to share, just where you are in your investing, we'll let Al go. He's got a football game to deal with. Uh, um, <laughs> just kidding. Uh, but if anyone wants to, you know, we're, again, I really want to build a culture where we're all in this together. We're all in different places with investing. So it's not, even if you want to just share anything that's not Detroit or lending related, like me and Aaron will stay on here. Like I, I want to meet everyone. I want to, you know, help you guys wherever you are. So let's, any Detroit questions, let's get those done real quick. Frank. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, my questions are for uh, Detroit. I was going to ask you when I'm looking at turnkey inventory lists, one of the big things that's been nice in the past is when they, when there's somewhere we can find a scope of work that's on what's been done to each individual property. Um, important things to me are always, you know, age of roof, what's the plumbing and electrical like, electrical, mainly when we're shopping for insurance, you know, a lot of them don't like to insure if there's aluminum wiring or knob and tube, obviously, things like that. Yeah. Um, so all of our properties are city certified. So anything that you just mentioned, like insurance and knob and tube and aluminum, uh, that's not going to fly with the city either. So I can, I can rest assure you that that's no problem. And hey, Al, while you're talking about uh, that is a really good mention too, is maybe just briefly mention how many inspections each property <laughs> in Detroit, they have to go through multiple inspections. So that's even, you don't just have your own home inspection. You have literally the city has to approve it also. If you want to just tell them quickly yeah. about those. Absolutely. So when, when buying a turnkey property from us, you're going to have, like Ali said, multiple sets of eyes that are going to be going through, walking through the property prior to you guys taking ownership, starting off with our own project manager. Our own project manager has to have it signed off, walking through the property, um, meeting all of the criteria of the scope of work that I share with you guys. And then obviously you're going to have your own third party inspector, which is another set of eyes. And then Aaron's going to have his appraiser that's yep. going to be walking through the property. That's going to also has to meet their bank criteria. And then you're going to have a city inspector walk through the property. That's going to look at electrical, mechanical, plumbing, building, zoning, safety, HVAC, roofing, you know, the whole nine yards. And then you're going to have a lead inspector also. <laughs> to make sure that the house is lead-based pain-free. And then last but not least, also, once you guys take ownership, if you decide you want to have a re-inspection on the property for all the repairs that were done, that's totally up to you guys. So you're going to have multiple sets of eyes before you guys take ownership of the property. Um, so uh, when it comes to some of those questions that you talked about, like age of roof or life or this or that, we can answer all of those on the front end. And on the back end, you're going to have all those, you know, stamps and reassurances of what we talk about on the front end. And the standard with them is typical turnkey, like minimum 10 years life left, you know, yeah. all that kind of yeah. stuff. And one thing Al mentioned, I think, knock on wood, nobody's appraisal has come in low yet since my buyers started going. I don't think we've had any low appraisals of my folks yet, have we? No, not of your folks. Which is unheard of. I I don't think I've ever worked with a provider in any market where at least something didn't come in with a low appraisal. So all of these properties are appraising pretty easy. We're not immune to it. Look, it happens. It's mm -hmm. just a beast, right? Um, and if it does happen, guys, it's quite simple. We have a discussion about it and we work it out. I've never had anything crazy come about. Um, recently, I had something come short, like twenty five hundred bucks, I believe it was. That's it. <laughs> yeah. And uh, 
you know, it was like a hundred and forty some thousand dollar sale, and we just covered it. The seller covered it, so that's not always going to happen. I'm not going to tell you the seller is always going to cover it, but in this instance, seller covered it. So, you know, if it does happen, there's a discussion that's going to be had. Yeah, I, I think that was actually one of ours, Al, and uh, and I think it was maybe even less than twenty five. It was like seventeen, it was some odd number, you know kind what? of the appraiser. Like, what are you doing? Like seventeen hundred. I think you're right. I, I, yeah, I, and uh, and yeah, within you know a day, Al, you know, had discussed with the client, they had come to an agreement, and we were pushing forward from the lending side, and uh, and that one's closing this next week. Um, but yeah, I haven't the. The all for all the hype about you know home prices might be declining, appraisals beg to differ. You know the values are still there, and uh, you know market like Detroit is still going you know stronger than ever. Uh, to be quite frank, yeah. And a lot of those articles about housing prices dropping, they don't really clear, they don't specify, but it's usually the bigger cities like LA, New York, like the high priced, high end kind that's, of places. They're not talking exactly right. typically about little suburban you know, markets. And you would think with mm -hmm. demand, buyer demand being down that it would change, but there's still a supply shortage. There's still enough demand. Like Al ultimately sells all the properties. It's just at the slower speed than it used to be, but it's not indicative of anything coming down, especially not somewhere like Detroit. Detroit's knock on wood, only going up from what I can tell. Any more Detroit questions before Al hops off? I just want to say thank you guys for, I'm going to jump off myself here calling from Detroit. Um, it was really nice to meet you too. I'm really excited to see you guys again in October and um, it's good to meet Aaron again. Um, we'll be in contact very, very soon. Thank you. Awesome. Perfect. Awesome. Sounds great. Thanks soon. Calvin. I and then if you guys do end up with any Detroit questions, email me, I'll copy out, like I said, any, any, anything. And then same with copying Aaron and all that too. So Al, if you need to hop off, thank you for joining on a Saturday. And when I told Al, I was like, I'm thinking about Saturday. I've never really done a weekend call because during the week, it's hard with difference in time zones and people working and all that. And I was like, but don't people have a life on Saturday? I don't know. And I was certain Al was, you know, he's got kids. I was like, there's no way I'm going to pin Al down. He was like, I'll make it happen. So thank you for joining. Me to, my kids are waiting for me to swim. So oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> I want to do my daddy daycare now. So do your thing. Do your thing. Right now. So I appreciate you guys all jumping on. I really, I, I mean that. Um, and, you know, I look forward to working with every single one of you guys. If you can come out here to Detroit, please do. I want to meet you guys. I want to work with you guys. And I uh, want you guys to all see Detroit. Yeah. yeah, that too. That's exciting. Awesome. Good seeing Thanks, you out, Al. man. Thank you see so you. much. See you guys. Bye now. So we, if anyone has, does anyone have anything left for Aaron? You've got like one of the best lenders at your disposal. If anyone wants to just kind of jump in, say hi, we're at this point, it is optional to be here. I, <laughs> for good or for bad, have no life for the rest of the day. I might watch some football later, but I'm chilling out. And I thought my problem with these calls is I get so excited and then I'll talk forever. And I'm like, I assume people need to get back to, you know, their Saturday or something, but I'm game to hang out as long as you guys want to hang out, ask questions, introduce yourself, anything. Chet, did I see your mute come off? Yes. <laughs> Yay. So Chet was on kids. the Detroit tour yeah. in March. Chet has been one of my favorite buyers. He He's done phenomenal with his investing. So I was jazzed when I saw him register for this. Yeah, so sorry. Uh, <laughs> I went to a party last night and woke up late. So I apologize. <laughs> no worries. I'm glad you're here. I yeah, don't know about that roll tide, Dustin. I was about to say, <laughs> Chet, I got to cut you off for a second. I saw the so also <laughs> roll, roll tide, tide. <laughs> and can sh like I don't even know where to go about last week's game. But I are let's see, are they playing right now? Yeah, we're going into halftime down by one. Oh, not looking very good. Are, but. Oh God! So they, I'll as soon as I get off here, I'll be switching over to the Alabama football game. Now, <laughs> not for good reasons. Like, oh God! <laughs> <laughs> thank you for jumping on, Dustin. I, you and I haven't yes. talked in a minute, so I was glad to see your name pop up. Yeah, thank y'all for putting this together. It was really informative. Appreciate it. Absolutely, absolutely. We we may have to touch base after the game. <laughs> yeah, we'll either that. crying or celebrating one or the other <laughs> I know it's, uh, when you have such a history of uh, doing so well it can be very painful oh yeah it's it's an adjustment period this year <laughs> for sure <laughs>
But no, I was going to drop off, but thank y'all. I appreciate everything. Well, I think if anyone, if no one else has, does anyone else have Kia? Kia, Kia right? Kia. Yeah. Oh, it's so good to have you on. I, you and I have talked a good bit and we've never actually gotten this I off. know. I'm ready to pull the trigger now, though. So Can we'll you come to Detroit in October? Uh, you know what? I can't come in October, so I probably won't be able to do the trip, but I, I would buy sight unseen. Cool. I, if I was going to do it from anybody, I trust Al and Aaron and team. So yeah, let's touch base for sure. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. So it's good to see you. This. You too. Awesome. Can I ask a question to Aaron? Yeah, of course. Uh, sorry. Uh, yes, I uh, just have a question. So I'm actually in the middle of like switching to another job because uh, you mm -hmm. know, like they got better paid and stuff. Sure. Is there like a... Um, like a timeline or time frame, like once I get a job, let's just say I get a job date next month, right? Do I need to wait a couple of months before yeah, I so apply? That, that's an excellent question, uh, Chester. And it all has to do with the type of job. So if you're going from like a salary gig to a salary gig, uh, we're completely fine. Even if there's a, you know, uh, and of course we're talking similar pay, but uh, you know, even if there's a, a 30 day gap or something, it, it, we'll still be okay. If, if you're going from uh, you know, one job to it's, it's all about the, the type of the new employment. So if it's something that's going to be commission based or mm -hmm. bonus based or overtime based Fannie Mae is generally, we're going to need at least a year at that job uh, because they they will need that for what they call a uh, variable income. If it's uh, if it's a salary type of gig, uh, even if you're paid hourly, but you know you're on a salary scale and you've got that offer letter uh, or something like that, then it's completely fine. If okay. if you if it's like 10.99 work, something like that, back to a year. So in a lot of cases, majority of people are going to be on some type of salary. So a lot of times it's a non-issue, but it is something, it's a great question. It is something extremely important, uh, you know, that we need to factor in. Uh, but a lot of times, you know, as long as it's a similar job, same pay structure, uh, we can clear all the hurdles from the, the Fannie Mae standpoint, but all about the type of pay at the end of the day. Awesome. Thank you so much for asking me. Yeah, of course. Of course. Yeah, appreciate it. Anybody else for any, Robbie, I didn't even say hi to you when you got on. I, I saw your name a little while ago. I was super excited you got on. So thanks for joining. Thanks for all. I mean, you guys have hung on like champs on a Saturday. Absolutely. Yeah. And I would say my one, you know, from the lending standpoint, my one, uh, I guess my advice always is everyone's different. You don't really know what box you're going to fit in in the Fannie Mae standpoint. It's a lot easier to get qualified for an investment property loan than, than one might think. Um, but everyone's different, but you, you don't know till you know. So it's, you know, apply, figure out, you know, what your borrowing capacity is, figure out, oh, you know, I've got this job coming up or, you know, I'm closing on this other property, you know, tomorrow, how soon can I afford a, a, my next property to add to my portfolio? We're, you, you know, we're your resource for all that information. Even if you just want to continue to, you know, monitor the market before applying and, you know, Hey, haven't applied yet, but thinking about this property, you know, how we looking, that's, you know, we're kind of going back to the whole communication piece. It's not a, a you know, we hook you on the rate and adios. It's it's a, a ongoing relationship as you know we go from the planning stage to the actual purchasing and then kind of the the what's next uh stage. But yeah, all starts with you know if, if do you have any questions, you know, reach out to Ali, she'll link us together. And uh, you know, whether it's phone, email, we hop back on a Zoom. Uh we're here to help. Cool. Frank, you awesome. unmuted. You got anything? Uh, I have uh, a lot of questions, but they're not, um, I mean, we can probably answer them over time. I was thinking um, to look at the inventory list for, for that market. And uh, like we were saying, the scopes of work and things. And uh, Aaron, earlier you mentioned um, like picking up, just say we found two turnkeys that we liked and mm -hmm. wanted to purchase them at the same time. I, I guess I'll be getting in contact with you to 
go through the pre-qualification process um, just to see, because in our case, our debt to income ratio has always been, seems to always have been a factor, even though we don't have a lot of debt other than our primary yeah, uh, mortgage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's been a challenge to overcome, but I think having rentals, uh, we started buying again in 2020 mm -hmm. and, and having that year or coming up on two with the rental incomes and stuff, it seems to have helped a little bit. Um, but then uh, we're also going to, I guess, want to look at our reserves, make sure we have enough there to cover what we're thinking. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So that's something that we could absolutely help you take a look at. And mm -hmm. as far as, you know, purchasing, if you, you know, if the goal was to purchase two in that same, you know, 30 day period or, or whatever it might be, then yeah, we make sure all those boxes are checked so that you're good to go on that. What's cool if, if both the properties are also already rented out, tenanted out, then we can actually factor in that projected rental income on both those properties, which is only going to help that debt to income ratio overall as well. So yeah, that's, you know, if, you know, if that was, you know, the goal, then that's absolutely something we can take a look at and, and maybe it pans out where, okay, we can only get you qualified for one now, but you know, once we get the reserves up enough for the next one, then we can do the next one a couple months from now. So absolutely be happy to, to walk through that with you. Okay. That sounds great. And that reminded me of a question for Ali. Um, I, I know a lot of turnkey providers don't um, place tenants before closing, or that's not part of their deal anymore. But I wonder about this provider, Ali, what is their situation with that? Yeah, I actually thought about that during the call and I was like, oh, we should have hit on that at some point. Uh, so Al is kind of a mix. Some of the properties will already have tenants. Some will not. So far, I've done a lot of knocking on wood for this thing. And, you know, you've been around long enough to know that there's a cycle with turnkey providers. What's true will one minute may not be true, but so far with Al, any of the properties that have sold that are not yet rented, it's not been a problem. Kind of like John in St. Louis. Um, there, you know, like Birmingham was awful when the properties were sold vacant. There's a lot of risk that comes with a vacant property. So far, I haven't seen any problems at all if the property is not tenanted at closing and the tenants get placed pretty quick. And also with Al, like if you just absolutely want to make sure that tenants are in before closing, he can, you can pick a property that will accommodate that. It's a hard thing with turnkey because like, I'm pretty rarely a fan of buying a turnkey without tenants already, just because of the risk factors that come in. But it's a little bit of a hard balance because like on Al's case or any turnkey provider, the holding time, you know, they can't place a tenant or they barely can even start marketing the property until the rehab's done, which means the turnkey provider's job at that point, the main job is over and done, which is the rehab. And the amount of time they can be forced to hold the property waiting for, because you, know, you want good tenants, you don't want just anybody. It's a huge holding expense to them. So it gets a little challenging because they end up having to pay a lot of money to hold it. So they want to get rid of it sooner. But then on the buyer side, you don't always want to close without tenants. So it's, it's that kind of walking that fine line. So Al has properties that fit both. And, you know, usually a provider is one or the other, either they all come with tenants or they all don't. He's got a mix of everything. And that's kind of also part of this buyer's market thing. You know, Aaron was giving uh, accolades to why it's so nice to be a buyer right now is you can force that. You can say like, I, I want a property where the tenants are going to be in by the end of it. Back in 2020, Godspeed. You couldn't like nobody, you couldn't get that at all. And you had to take that risk on. But so if you do end up with a property from Al, again, anything can happen. But so far, there I don't think I've heard of anybody having more than a month. And I think Al and I think he covers the tenant placement fee, you know, after the fact. Um, so it's been a non-issue, but the short answer is both. But you can you can kind of have your way with that one however you want it. Okay. Do you know um, if uh, what their experience or um, opinion is, or if they work with Section 8 tenants? They do. I can't remember. I've asked this of Al a couple of times. I don't know that I've actually heard of anyone ending up with Section 8 tenants. I don't know that for it's for a specific reason. And Aaron, I don't know if you know when you guys close, you may know if there's I'd Section have to 8 defer. tenants. Yeah, I'd have to. We don't 
we don't care too much about you don't, that you as don't care. Yeah, yeah so i was like uh, i didn't know if you guys take the paper totally good question i want to I don't say think i've heard of any well it doesn't mean they aren't and they're not opposed to section eight i just can't remember the exact dynamics i don't think there's a big plus or minus one way or the other with you know some cities it's better to go section eight some cities it's better to go market tenant i think it i think they get a good many i think a lot of market tenants with them which is a good sign yeah yeah, the one we picked up in Gary, they don't, um, well, because it's all, I guess, county-based, right, in every Section 8 um, in in different counties. Some are great to work with, some are not yeah. so good to work with. And in Gary, I guess that's the case. So they prefer not to work with Section 8 in yeah. that market. Al and their property management, they will work with Section 8. They have no problem with it. I just don't know how many of them end up being Section 8. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you bet. Cool. And if no one else has anything else, I think we'll let everyone get back to football, cocktails, family time. Yeah, whatever. thank you again for helping to put this together, Allie. This has been oh, you awesome. Bet. I feel like we got a real good uh, just conversation going, and uh, I feel hyped up myself. So I know I I'm like, kind of yeah, I'm, I'm like I think good. I need it. Aside from everyone else, I'm like I think I needed this. It's but you know it's just. You hear so much negativity right now about investing, and I just want to take like a bullhorn and be like, "It's still good to invest." Yeah. And it, there's all those silver linings, yeah. absolutely. And absolutely. like hearing your perspective, and Al, you know, there's a lot that I forget. You know, I know everything, and then I forget it, and I forget to be excited about it. And so, just so you guys know, now that we're just kind of casually talking, so I'm creating a new online community. Frank probably knows this. Like, I'm the Facebook group. It's so limited on Facebook. Mm -hmm. A, mm -hmm. everyone has to be on Facebook, and B, it just you know, post on get out. So I'm building an online thing where we can all be outside of Facebook. Nice. But in that, I've been pondering, I want to start doing monthly, I want to do two live events a month at a minimum, a happy hour every month and a like brunch, you know, just kind of like this, where even more casual than this, where like anyone who's investing, like we literally it's like we all go to happy hour and just talk yeah. about whatever, not specific markets, anything. So I want to get more of this going because, you know, like I said earlier, and it was kind of my own advice to me is I forget that this is not an individual sport. It's so fun. And I love these tours, the trips, meeting people, these calls, just because I get to like hang out with you. Like we had so much fun on the Detroit trip in March, like stupid amounts of fun. And, you know, it's so easy for us to forget that we are all actually people and not faces behind the internet kind of thing for sure so for yeah sure. I this call was fun for me and I'm like whoo I'm like what do I need to I'm like oh I need to clean up the um properties page that my new employee did interesting <laughs> jobs on <laughs> but yeah I'm I'm jazzed up and Aaron thank you so much for jumping on I think you know yeah. everybody's focused on the lending right now and you shared so many things that we're just great insights to have where it's not this black and white doom and gloom kind of thing. So I appreciate your time. Absolutely. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, thank you to everyone who's on it. If any of the people watching the replay are still watching, rock on. That's awesome. And please email <laughs> me with questions, comments. If, you know, if you liked doing an event like this, let me know. Weekdays work better, weekends. You know, I want to build a community where we are doing more than most people offer in real estate. You know, it's just not that social of a community sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to do more of these. So if you have ideas on what you'd like to see, questions you like answered, all that kind of stuff, please email me. If you want to get in touch with Al or Aaron, email me. And yeah, we'll call it a, we'll call it a Saturday. Awesome. 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 Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Take care. Take right, care, guys. Too.